sans test. <coughs> Thank you, it works. Awesome. <coughs> Sound level is good? Uh, I can hear you fine. Okay, perfectly. Thanks. Yeah, it's very clear. Good morning, everyone. We will start in five minutes. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to this training. So this training is a, an introduction and a generic training about MISP. Um, obviously, if you are already advanced and very familiar to MISP, uh, you might know a lot already from this training. You might even discover some tricks and some new idea uh, how to use MISP. Um, but the session for today is really a, a two-hour and 30-minute uh, sessions for the one that doesn't know about um, about MISP and want to have a quick introduction and so on. We will um, recap at the end uh, the best practices for encoding trend intelligence, and we'll show you an example of encoding. Uh, maybe for the one that are only familiar with MISP, then they might discover some tricks and techniques to uh, improve their encoding uh, skills uh, in uh, in MISP. So the session is is kind of interactive. So at the end of the session, we have a Q and A. Uh, don't hesitate uh, to use the chat live if you have any questions. So we are two. So Sami and I are directly answering questions to you. Uh, if you have more advanced questions and things like that, we can do it at the end of the sessions. Um, nevertheless, don't hesitate to uh, ask questions in the chat. It's there to, to, be, uh, to be accessible. Um, all the uh, training materials, uh, elements, and so on are available on this uh, community pad uh, that everyone can get access to. The URL of the pad is on tinurl.com slash generic-misp, uppercase. And you can get access to that uh, pad. The link was uh, shared in the meeting chat too. Uh, so the agenda for today is, is basically uh, four parts. The first one is really an introduction to MISP, uh, what is all about, the history of MISP and so on. Then a bit about the data model, uh, especially that you will hear about uh, terminology terms, um, about uh, MISP and trend intelligence that maybe are recurring. Data model is there to help you to understand how data is structured in MISP and how you can encode your information. Then we'll go into a more detailed uh, example. So we have a kind of 10 commandments uh, and best practices for uh, MISP users uh, for encoding trade intelligence. So it's usually best practices. Uh, it is not golden rules, but it's rule that you can follow and, and that's helping everyone when they have to process information in trade intelligence that are encoded in MISP. And then we'll go into a non-coding demo um, uh, together. So we'll show you how to do the, uh, the encoding. At the same time, for the one that are interested, we provide an access to a MISP instance, which is basically a training instance. Um, so you will be able to connect to that instance. Uh, there are more than 50 accounts. You can even reuse accounts from other. It doesn't matter as long as you don't change password. Um, the password is mentioned on the uh, shared part. Uh, you can connect on that one. And if you want to play with MISP during the training and the sessions, uh, feel free is there to be, uh, uh, to, to be available for, for people willing to test. But there is no obligation then you can just follow what we are uh, uh, doing and showing in uh, the sessions of today um, just some logistic part um, all the uh, deck materials and so on are public and accessible to everyone uh, this session will be recorded and for the one that are interested there is uh, uh, the ability to get a certificate of participation so if you need one just drop an email to info at circle.lu and we can uh, provide you one so let's start with the quick introduction of, of MISP uh, and what it's all about for the one that are really not familiar with MISP. Um, this one is, I think, the basic, where MISP started and so on. So, um, and that's where it's starting is about collaboration. And I think for everyone here in, on, the, uh, on this session, it's important to collaborate on information sharing and so on. Um, but really the initial goal of MISP in 2012 uh, so it's a project that's more than 10 years old nowadays, um, was the uh, information sharing aspect. And it came from a case that we had uh, uh, at uh, Benelux level, where we basically working, we were basically working on the same case without knowing the other, uh, Cécirte, uh, was working on the same case. And for us, it was kind of, a, I would say, pity or a discovery that we didn't like because we were capable of, of, of you know, doing reversing, things like that but we were not capable of having tools to actually share this information uh, in a proactive way and, and being, um, I would say, quite active on uh, and reactive on the uh, information sharing aspect. Um, so the initial version of MISP was uh, CyberDefSec. Um, it's, it came from an initial plan from Christophe on the Plav, Ministry of Defense. Um, and then the later, uh, the platform uh, became a MISP. Uh, Circle. Um, took over the development of uh, the MISP uh, core software. And um, basically, the software increased into kind of 
feedback of users to improve the, the software. The thing that is interesting in the misdevelopment is really based on a requirement and practical use case. Um, so it's not coming from out of the blue, it's really coming from uh, problems and uh, issues that we wanted to solve. And nowadays, basically, MISP is a community-driven uh, project. So Sami and I, uh, we are part of the Circle, um, which is basically the self of the private sector communes and non-governmental entities in Luxembourg. Um, we are uh, operated by LHE, uh, which is an uh, economical interest group uh, funded by the Ministry of Economy. Um, so for us, it's, it's quite important there that the funding of MISP is uh, continuous funding. Uh, we have different funding schemes for MISP. Uh, some are coming from the dotation, some are coming from uh, Luxembourgish Army, some are coming from private partnerships and so on. Uh, so really for us, it's, it's a commitment on uh, development of MISP on the long term. Um, so what we are doing at uh, Circle is basically we did development of, of the project. Um, I will go into detail that uh, from these uh, 10 years, this project grew into a significantly uh, large project uh, and is used by many organizations, um, military, intelligence communities, private organizations, financial sectors, national CSIRT, and many others like law enforcement and so on. Uh, the first thing that you have to keep in mind, and that's really something that we will mention during the, the session of today, uh, you have missed the software, so which is basically the core software uh, around it, and you have missed communities, so those are sharing communities. Uh, don't mix up, mix up both, it's, it's uh, separated, uh, but if you start to run your own MISP instance, it's a sharing community. Um, so it's, it's, it's basically, when you start a MISP, you basically start your own community. At Circle, we operate different sharing communities, uh, from financial sectors, uh, specific telecom operators at European level and so on, that we are uh, co-managing with different partners. Uh, if you are curious, in the MISP instance itself, you can see the one that we know, so the communities that are publicly accessible, uh, that people can connect to, or at least request to connect to. Uh, but in different sectors of activities, there are many other private uh, communities that are publicly disclosed. But if you connect and know your community, you can connect to those uh, communities. So what is MISP? And uh, first of all, um, maybe something to, uh, to remove from, from your mind is the original names of MISP was Malware Information Sharing Platforms. It's not anymore this name, it's basically just MISP, uh, maybe for multiple information sharing uh, platforms, but technically the trade information sharing platforms. And that's very important for us, it's, it's basically a platform for doing information sharing. Um, and it's basically not only information, but it's intelligence and uh, information that are not only related to cybersecurity, but it's basically quite large. And in the demo of today, you'll see that you can encode a lot of data intelligence in different formats. Uh, the software and the backend is free and open source. That's quite important for us um, because we have a strong commitment on that aspect uh, to ensure that people can maintain, an organization can maintain the software, being autonomous and can even audit and analyze how the software is working. So the first, I would say, aspect of MISP is to collect information. And this collection of information could come from different sources of information. Uh, for example, it could come from partners. It could come from uh, tools that are automatically feeding the systems. Uh, it could come from analysts. So for example, if you deal with an incident, uh, you have information that you want to encode and you use MISP as a way to collect and structure this information. That's basically the first, I would say, way of, of getting information into, into MISP. But obviously, it's not, this is not the, I would say, ultimate goal of MISP. It's basically to... Uh, first start to normalize information, structure it. And that's really the session of today. We'll show you how you can do that, how you can basically structure and normalize this information. But MISC come with a lot of features that help you to um, discover if someone already working is already working on a specific case or a team or a SOC are already working on that due to the correlations. Um, correlation is one of the core components of MISP, uh, core, uh, com, uh, features of MISP. It's basically a way to automatically find out they are equivalent uh, attributes on an instance or even on remote instance uh, to find out if someone is working on similar cases and so on. And that's really important. Correlation is really a key element uh, to uh, evaluate the information that you receive, uh, evaluate the quality and so on. And then later on today, we will see in that uh, aspect uh, how you can basically use that uh, to benefit from the correlations, even to fine tune the correlations, uh, to basically limit correlations or increase correlations, uh, to discover uh, in interesting pivot point in your events that might relate it to other events. 
Then you have uh, additional capability to enrich the data. So that means if you collect additional data, you want to automate the enrichment of this data uh, to find out if you have additional information. Could be very simple things like uh, lookup of ashes uh, values into from various totals uh, to geolocations or specific IP addresses or uh, additional information. And then obviously MISP goal is to uh, support the collaboration between teams and communities that when you start to share information, uh, you can basically get feedback from others, have additional information coming from different uh, organizations and so on. And that's really the, the key element of, of MISP is the aspiration of collaborations, um, which start from the early beginning. If you have a MISP instance and you have already two users, it's a way to collaborate and share the information. But you'll see that MISP come with a lot of advanced features for sharing and uh, collaborations. Uh, we'll go into detail on that uh, later on, but it's really one of the uh, elements. Obviously, when you have so, such kind of information that are normalized structures and correlating, you might want, uh, and that's usually one of the goals, is to use that data to feed different systems. It could be, for example, automated uh, protective tools. So for example, like endpoint protection device, firewalls, uh, access list, uh, network protection device. Uh, it could be um, analysts that use the data and so on. Or you can even generate, for example, periodic re reporting for the uh, different information that you need. So that you'll see that MISP has different way of ex extracting the data and so on. Um, there's a complex API. It won't be the topic of today, uh, but there's in the uh, um, uh, Ashdoc document a link to the open API. So if you are already quite familiar with uh, API, uh, REST queries and so on, uh, you can have a look at this and, and see how you can benefit from the data that you have in your MISP into your tool that might use the, the API. So that's really the, the core, I would say, functionality of MISP. So it's a trade information uh, uh, platforms, um, which is completely open source, and you can run uh, your own as, as you wish. So just regarding the functionalities and features of MISP, it came from, I would say, a set of features that were limited initially to, uh, I would say, malware reversers, um, incident responder, but over time, the informations and the use cases improved. So that means, for example, some users um, started to encode information for malware reversing, but at one point in time, they started to see interesting aspects of infrastructure of attackers being uh, similar, uh, information that might be of interest for uh, takedown notification and so on. And so you see that more and more users were basically interested in the way that this is working to improve their uh, workflow. And then that, that's all MISP evolved over time. We get more and more users. And that's why the platforms came to complete intelligence platforms where, for example, intelligence analysts were able, for example, to uh, describe the techniques, the tactics of the attackers uh, in a simple way uh, and describing stories. We'll go today into the details of, of creating relationships between graphs and so on. Um, we have some, some nice examples there uh, where you can see that um, MISP can be used to describe a story and to facilitate the interpretation and the, the comprehensions of what information you encode into MISP for analysts and other groups that need to analyze the information that you share. And obviously, over the time, as more and more users were using the platforms, you see different use cases that were popping up, um, law enforcement, even risk analysis teams. So for example, a lot of risk analysis were like based on not really real data, but nowadays, when you have a lot of information in a MISP instance about incidents, the specific uh, uh, thing discovered by your analyst and so on, you start to have valuable metrics that can be used for your risk analysis team. So that's, that's why MISP over time came to a complete solution from indicator base up to intelligence and more uh, reporting aspect uh, and so on. And you'll see that the platform itself is really capable of, of not handling only cybersecurity indicators, but different kind of indicators and informations. Uh, for example, uh, MISP has been extended quite, quite a lot for uh, fraud and financial frauds, for example. Uh, so that means you can encode uh, things like bank account numbers, uh, mule account, uh, suspicious transactions, and so on. And you can even correlate things that are related to cybersecurity and financial frauds in the uh, same kind of events. And you'll see that you can even mix kind of hybrid attacks. Um, so if you have to describe complex attacks, uh, including physical attacks, uh, cybersecurity attacks, and so on, you can easily encode that in, into, uh, into a MISP. Today, we will show you an example where there are already a lot of, of type of indicators uh, and information that were collected by the analyst 
and how to encode it into MISP. Um, that, so that's, that's the, uh, the idea. Obviously, in two hours, we cannot go over all the uh, data structure that we have in MISP and so on. But the, the idea is really to give you the hints where to search for additional information and so on into it. So really, MISP has been built on different use cases and different user feedback. And for us, it was really, uh, really important on those aspects because it's basically having a software that is able to be used by different kind of users. Um, just a side note regarding the model of governance and all the, the features in MISP are, are growing. So it's basically based on uh, feedback of users, including the session of today for us is important because it's if you have any idea, things that you want to see in MISP, it's, it's a good opportunity to share that with us um, because we could include that into our list of um, uh, features that might be of interest for you. So for example, if you would like to see, I don't know, new features, just drop us a, a GitHub issues or even in the chat, we can uh, track down those. And for us, it's very important because it's, it's basically a way to sort all those priorities. Um, and more with that, we have feedbacks, more we, we know which kind of use cases are more used into, uh, into MISP. Uh, so we do a lot of, of training aspect and so on, uh, a lot of collaborations with MISP and come from different user groups. So there are many user groups that we don't manage that are managed by different MISP users or developers. Uh, nevertheless, we try to reach out to those groups to discuss with them on a regular interval to collect uh, features uh, requests uh, for MISP or for example, even report of bugs and things like that. Uh, so for us, it's really a community-driven project. Um, we have some additional, uh, I would say, uh, extension in MISP to, um, to be a bit kind of innovative too. So that means if we get some idea to implement and so on, we try out the, the implementation into MISP, uh, see if it works, and then um, we uh, implement it by default into MISP or we discard this kind of feature. So for us, it's a kind of outgoing and organic uh, increase of MISP. There are plenty of projects outgoing right now. Uh, so it's uh, for us interesting to gather feedback. It's really, really important for the development of, of MISP because it's based on, on, that, uh, on that feedback. So just to keep in mind, uh, there, there are, uh, I, would say, I would say, quite of challenges in MISP um, uh, regarding the uh, uh, objective of the different user groups. Um, uh, I mentioned this in the, in the slide deck uh, because I think it's important that um, about the expectations when you create intelligence in MISP. Um, the, people and organization that will use the data might have very different objectives. Um, and that's important because when you create information, you don't exactly know who will uh, handle this information. Will it be a machine? Will it be another organization working in the same field? Will it be uh, someone doing reporting and things like that? So it's quite important to keep that in mind. So the more you contextualize, for example, the more that you provide details about what you discover, what you are sharing and so on, uh, it's giving more int for the different use cases. And usually we can see three different use cases and three different objectives. Uh, and those can be mixed between teams, uh, can be the same person can have those different objectives too. Um, so one of the main one in MISP is when you start to search, uh, to, to um, share intelligence, um, obviously those are used for detection. And that's, I think, one of the main goals for a, a SOC, a CSIR search, is being able to find out if you were vulnerable or compromised by a specific threat actor, for example, or adversaries. And the detection aspect is really important. So a lot of information that is shared within MISP communities are for detections. Uh, that makes sense. I mean, you want to know if you're infected and so on, and as fast you share the information, the better it is, and the better you, are, you can respond to it. But <laughs> Detections in such kind of levels, you might have false positive. So that means, for example, some organizations might introduce false positive. We'll talk about that today quickly about the different mechanism in MISP that you have to limit false positive. But this is another thing that is important because some people might use, and some organization might use the information not to, to detect but where false positive has an impact, but in so large impact, but to block, for example. If you have an ISP, for example, that receives indicators like of phishing and so on, and if you have a false positive into it, and they automatically block access uh, to some website and so on, this might have a bigger impact. So keep that in mind, for example, about the quality of the information that you are pre providing to add, for example, specific qualifications, saying that uh, it's a trusted source, or the information may be... Uh, um, uh, unreliables. Um, so you have plenty of things in MISP to describe that. And that's quite important to keep that in mind because you never know 
when the information is flowing and being shared among different communities, where it will end up and how it will be used. So that's quite important. Even in some cases, people are really using the system in a different way than you can expect. Um, and as an example, it's not uncommon that some people are using this to, uh, to for example, cross-validate the quality of feeds. So they don't really care about um, the false positive rate and so on, but they care about the overlap and the comparison that they can do between different feeds. So just keep that in mind. You have different objectives. Those can be conflicting. Um, in this, we try to support you by providing contextualizations. Um, we'll go back to that, and uh, uh, Sammy and I, we will show you how, how to improve contextualization. It's super important because it's really, uh, I would say, uh, um, improves the expectation on the other end uh, when dealing with information that is shared in MISP. Uh, just a side note regarding communities using MISP. Um, many of, of users are using MISP in different way. Um, uh, for example, us as Circle, we have, uh, I think, around 17 communities nowadays. Uh, for example, we have what we call the default uh, private, private sector communities where a lot of organizations are there, where you have more than 4,000 users actively sharing, using the, the, the system, synchronizing with their, their instance and so on. But then you have plenty of models uh, using MISP in, in, in different shape to um, uh, actually share information either within their groups, to fetch only information from others, and you only use it in their, uh, I would say, island without sharing back. You have some, some organizations that are um, willing to share some data, but not everything. Uh, you have um, some communities that are based on topic. Um, so for example, there's a dedicated uh, MISP community for COVID-19. There are uh, MISP communities used for disinformation campaigns. Um, you have uh, MISP communities that are only for software vulnerabilities and so on. So it's pretty large. Um, even us as, as MISP core developers, we don't know about all those communities. Um, we know some of them. We support some, we maintain some, but there are plenty out there. So um, don't hesitate to reach out to some of your community and ask if they have a MISP instance. Uh, it, it could be the case. Um, for example, if you are a first member, um, first.org member, uh, they have a MISP server, so you can get access to automatically to that and get access to the information share by the different members. So let's keep that in mind. You have different kind of communities in MISP, and that's fine. Um, and you can even have kind of shared communities. If you're into the military sectors, might be completely private, just gather information. You don't share anything up to communities that are, I would say, more wide open and sharing uh, active information with many organizations. Uh, just regarding the, the sharing difficulties, keep that in mind that there are uh, plenty of, of restrictions that might uh, have an impact on the, on the information sharing aspect. Um, for the past, I would say, 12 years, we know, know quite well the different sharing communities, um, and we try to provide uh, to all users of MISP um, tooling, documentation, and so on, especially to support them uh, in, in the case of sharing. Common example, a lot of people are men mentioning the GDPR or a privacy regulation that might impact the sharing aspect. Uh, we, we did a complete set of documents regarding that. Uh, if you go on the MISP project compliance uh, pages, you'll see that we have a specific one for GDPR, where basically the GDPR is used as a kind of positive uh, site. So that means uh, actually the, the act of inf uh, sharing of information is a way to protect yourself. Um, and that's quite important there, is, is to see that even some regulations are quite positive. In the financial sectors, for example, there's a new directive called DORA uh, regarding the information sharing aspect that you need to have information sharing uh, communities and so on. Um, so even some legal uh, framework are supporting that. Nevertheless, the, the main problem is the, um, I would say, social interaction. Uh, you might have people that are willing to share, some of them are not willing to share. Um, it's normal, I would say. I, say I, would, I think it's very human. Um, if you take a, a school, for example, it's not uncommon that you have a group of people sharing between each other, but not sharing with others. Exactly the same in uh, sharing communities. You might have specific group and so on. So um, in MISP, you have plenty of different functionalities or to share information, to fine tune the sharing groups and so on. Uh, and then you can even reflect that. So if you want to, you don't have, you have a specific distrust for specific uh, know, countries, communities and so on, you can really uh, limit these kind of things to a specific group. Uh, regarding MISP itself, um, if you go back 12 years ago, it was like a very simple software uh, with just a core backend software. But um, nowadays, it's a complete project. Um, 
just to summarize what are the different project in MISP, we have kind of four pillars uh, to classify those different aspects. Um, but you see there's a lot of interconnection between all of, of, of those things. First of all, this is obviously the open source software, which are obviously the software to run the core components. Um, there are more than 60 repositories in the MISP uh, GitHub pages, uh, because we have different sub project and project. Obviously, you have the core software with the web interface, the API, the backend, and uh, storage, and so on. But then you have additional complementary software that are really bundled into, uh, into MISP. Uh, for example, you have the MISP modules, uh, which contain more than 250 modules of expansions for different services. Those ones can be run with MISP, can be standalone, uh, can use as expansion services with the different services. So it's a pretty large way of of extending MISP in an easy way. Um, for the one that are uh, willing to extend MISP on a programmatic way or automation way, uh, we have a complete library in Python called PyMISP, which is hiding some of the complexity of the API and simplified in a Pythonic way uh, the way to access MISP. Um, and then you have plenty of, of different uh, software. I will not go into details, but if you are curious, you can go on the GitHub pages and see all of the different repositories. Uh, it's pretty large. Uh, you can even use some part if you want. You are not used, uh, uh, obliged to use everything from the MISP uh, project. Uh, and some, some organizations are cherry picking what they want to install. Some are using MISP core software, some the MISP modules, or some are, are using the full blend set of software that we have, depending on what you like. In addition to that, and this one evolved over, over time, uh, is really the knowledge base that we have behind MISP, um, which is quite super important because the thing is, the software itself is not so interesting if you don't have a way to contextualize information. And that's why in MISP, we have what we call taxonomies, galaxies, and warning lists. Um, I will go first with the taxonomies. Uh, it's a way to labelize information and to put label on it, but to have those labels in kind of structure, structure way. So we have a set of existing knowledge base. There are more than 250 taxonomies nowadays from different fields, uh, aviations, uh, industries, uh, military intelligence organizations. So obviously, you won't use all taxonomies, but again, you can cherry pick, um, kind of doing your kind of, of your own, own selections uh, to see in, in your community which kind of taxonomy you want to use. Um, Sami will show you some good example on the um, best practices there, on which taxonomy to use, and so on. We'll give you some example. Again, it's not like those examples to follow, but it's things that we have seen in different communities. Over the time, we extended the, the taxonomies to something more advanced, where we can describe a lot of data models. Um, maybe some of you are familiar with Maitre attack, which is a matrix-like attack to describe the techniques used by attackers. This can be described as what we call missed galaxies. We have plenty of galaxies. For example, uh, as this project, we maintain a big one for trade actor and adversaries, uh, which contain a lot of information about or the trade actor is working, uh, what are the attributions, the different names, things like that. Um, and you can even extend it. Um, today, we'll not go too much into galaxies, but you, you'll show that it's a very nice way to contextualize information that you have. And we maintain those kind of lists up to the warning list, which are a list of potential false positive or things that need to be looked at. Um, it, it's maintained by us. It can be easily extended, and that's really important for us. In MISP, you can basically use the base knowledge base that you have, but you can extend those with new knowledge base, with new information, and so on. Over the time, the project um, became a kind of de facto standard, and to cover that standardization process, the um, MISP software is basically based on an open standard format, which is a MISP exchange course format, uh, which is an internet draft at uh, the Internet Engineering Task Force, um, which is standardized, uh, pretty stable for the past 10 years is really what we are using and with extensions to make it more flexible. And that's why we have the MISP object template. Um, there are templates of data structure that you can use. There are more than 250 object templates nowadays. Uh, and you can select what kind of thing that you can use, for example, uh, uh, vehicles, um, car plates. You can, you can have specific cybersecurity ones like, I don't know, domain IP up to things that are much more complex like person and so on. And you see that you can really uh, mix all the all, all of those kind of object templates together uh, to uh, describe what kind of information that you have. Then I would say the additional thing that we do is basically a lot of documentations, and even we provide some default feed in MISP. So by default, if you install a MISP instance, it's empty, empty. 
But if you want to have some, I would say, default cybersecurity feeds, um, in MISC, we have default one. Um, and us as Circle, we even provide an OSIN feed that can be used as a kind of example, but those ones are containing actual data coming from different sources that you can use for uh, protection measures and so on. As I was mentioning before, we produce a lot of documentations and documents. Like the session of today, all the training materials are online. You can basically have a look. We have even the source code of the different materials. Um, and we produce an additional document, white papers, uh, specific document on the legal aspect and so on, or best practices. So uh, I will not go into detail there, but uh, if you navigate on our website, you'll see that we have plenty of existing uh, documentations. So we talk about sharing, but what are the main functionality in MIS for sharing? Um, we'll go a bit about the distribution models and so on, but you have different ways of sharing uh, because you have different kind of organizations and they work in a different, different way. So by default in MIS, you have four levels of distribution. That's we say core model of distribution. So you can keep for your organizations, your community, your connected communities, or to the far, far way that you can share the information. In addition to that, we have fine tuning sharing uh, mechanism. One is, for example, sharing groups. So you can decide to create a group where you only share a part of the element to a specific organizations or a set of organizations. <clears throat> Sorry. Then, that's one way to, to share information. But you can even go in different way. You can even delegate the publication of information. I'll take an example. You are a bank uh, in the financial sector in Luxembourg. You want to share information, but you don't want to attach your name to a specific information that you want to share. So what you can do, you can delegate the publication to someone else. So there's a functionality in MISP which allow to do delegations. Um, it's very nice because you basically have a way to do pseudonymizations. So that means, for example, a bank can delegate to a banking association, the publications. They still share. They can still see that there is a complementary information being shared. And at the same time, uh, you see that those people that are using MISP for uh, um, uh, gathering information and so on, uh, they can still benefit from the information and provide back information back uh, to the organization without disclosing the name. So that's one way of doing it. Then in MISP, you have different way of, of sharing, uh, like uh, additional proposal, extended event. Classical example, um, I don't know, you have an antivirus vendor, so like Kaspersky, uh, providing a report. Um, you get a MISP event with all the reports, the information, and so on, but you don't agree with that report. You say that the conclusion are not correct. It's maybe a different perspective that you want. That's fine. In MISP, you can do what you call extended event. It's kind of competitive analysis. So on a specific event, you can extend it with your own analysis and your own um, information. Uh, and then depending of the sharing mechanism, you can even share this extended event back to the uh, uh, antivirus vendor, or you want to keep it for yourself or share it, for example, with a group of people that uh, that's working more for you. And that's quite important in MISP. You can really mix match those different models of sharing. Uh, you are not really bound to one model. So you can just activate in MISP the different models and your, for your community, your organization, or your group uh, when you want to share information. The sharing of information between MISP instances can be done in different ways. You can synchronize instances directly over the internet, over VPN, whatever, through classical TLS handshake. It's super easy. You can just like exchange API key, synchronize, and that's it. Uh, it's super easy because it's 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 a nice way to just say you want to pull, fetch data from another organization. You can even filter out. For example, you just want to see from that remote instance only that organization. You get the information and so on. That's one way of doing it. Um, if you don't have access to the MISP instance, you can even create a similar fetching mechanism with feeds, so you can get data from third party feeds and so on. A lot of security vendors are providing in MISP format their feeds data, and you can ingest into your MISP. And you can completely work in air gap mode too. If you are in the military sector and you don't want to be interconnected at all, you can even run your MISP in that way, and you can even ingest a specific MISP even through USB key or dedicated system and so on. And you can mix match that. So for example, if you want to pass from an air gap system into a connected system, it works automatically and transparently. So that means MISP even will be synchronized in different ways. So you can really use these different mechanisms uh, to synchronize your different um, uh, MISP instances and community. 
plenty of, of way of filtering uh, that. We're not going to detail into that, but um, it's super flexible. You can really filter what you want as information. You can even push only the information that you uh, basically release and so on. And this multiple layer of validation so like that you limit the risk of oversharing information that you don't want to share. Uh, other thing that you can even cache information. So if you have multiple misinstances containing very different data sets, you don't need to import the complete data set into your other misinstance, but you can cache and benefit from sharing and uh, um, uh, correlations between those uh, kind of in uh, instances. Again, there are plenty of functionalities. Today, we will pass through those, I would say, kind of information quality management because those ones are important, used on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. Um, obviously, one of the core functionality of MISP is the correlation. So when you start to see over correlation of value, things like that, or you see correlation of specific thing that you start to work on, it's maybe of interest for you. It's maybe, for example, a new event that someone is already working on. You can collaborate and so on. So correlation is really a, an element on that. In addition to that, you can provide sightings, uh, meaning that you can even refresh the data. Um, so uh, in the 10 commandments, you'll see that it's very important because you can automatically refresh your data set and your generation of indicators, for example, based on the sightings. Uh, as I was mentioning, there's a huge, and I think everyone of, of you knows about it, is a pain of dealing with false positive. Um, so we, we try to, to make it easier with MISC to automatically detect false positive, uh, and especially to uh, be able to uh, classify those kind of false positives. So that means sometimes some false positive might be interesting, uh, sometimes then you might want to block those into the API. Sometimes you just want to have that as context. Uh, Miss support the different uh, functionality for that. Um, there is a complete system for the workflow. Um, today we will not talk about that, but that's something that you want to investigate. If you are a bit serious about the complete workflow, uh, there's a workflow mechanism in MISP where you can uh, basically review the complete control the system of publication into, into MISP. Um, I will not go into details, but you have a flexible APIs, we have plenty of libraries uh, to these integrations. Uh, and then you have plenty of other information about uh, um, the different representations of the information in MISP. Sometimes you might encode information like, like I would say in a raw mode, like indicator, things like that. Um, but if you start to add, for example, timestamp, automatically MISP will build for you timelines. And that's really nice because um, if you start to create a report uh, and set the timeline and so on, you can see, for example, outliers. Could be mistakes, could be things that are interesting. You can see the, the first occurrence that might be, for example, the first initial infection, so the first uh, occurrence into your, uh, for example, attack pass, things like that. So as more you enter information, MIST try to be a bit clever and, and show you the information in different uh, different way. As I was mentioning, uh, we have a complete uh, chain for indicator uh, lifecycle management. So if you want to expire information into MISP, you can do that features. Uh, to expire automatically these informations and even in different way. Uh, so meaning that different team or even members of your teams might have different uh, life cycle management of the indicators depending on their use case. So just to conclude on the introductions really for us, the information sharing aspect and the trade intelligence is really coming from usage. Uh, it's case by case, it's depending of, of, of the kind of attack that you have, the kind of, 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 of uh, intelligence that you collect and so on. So it's really, uh, yeah. What we have seen in a lot of sharing communities is, is coming from imitations. So that means a lot of people are starting small, organically, and then they grow up into some complete uh, uh, trade intelligence platforms where they describe the attacks, the tactics, and the techniques. So MISP is just a tool. It's there to help you. Um, we try to make it as transparent as possible, even if the topic is quite complex, uh, and we try to, to support you there. Um, so again, the project itself is not only a software, but it's really a combination of different things, uh, including knowledge base, uh, the standard behind, the best practices, and so on. So for us, it's, it's really important that people are using MISP as a, a complete, I would say, workbench for doing trade intelligence and so on. So that was my quick introduction of MISP. So like that, for the one that didn't know at all about MISP, they can have a quick overview on it. Um, now we will go into more uh, to details into the data models, um, which is uh, something I think important because a lot of terms will be used there. Uh, and I will stop sharing my screen and give my screen to uh, Sami.
All right, just to confirm, you should be seeing my screen now. Perfectly. Perfect. Thanks a lot. Um, so yeah, thanks, Alex, for this great introduction. Uh, for those who are new to MISP, you might have uh, some question about some word that Alex used, mainly because they were about the MISP terminology. So what, we, what we'll do right now is we'll go quickly through the important aspect of uh, the data structure that we have in MISP to encode information, describe what they are, what they, what they can be used for. Um, yeah, so let's, let's start with that. Uh, all right, let's bring the presentation. And yeah, before I forget, uh, we also have created a cheat sheet um, that I will paste the link in the chat as well. There we go. Um, so if you are wondering about some term that we use uh, in MISP, wondering about how distribution works, how this synchronization works, uh, and some data structure that we have, everything is documented there. Um, so yeah. This is mainly like a summary of the presentation we'll be seeing right now. All right, let's move this up. Yeah, so as Alex is mentioning in the chat once again, if you have question, uh, don't hesitate. We have a Q&A uh, dedicated for that. All right, so let's see what we have in MISP. So in MISP, we have, that's the way I like to see uh, things, is we have two layers where you can add information. The first one is the what we call the data layer. This is basically the, the layer which contains the actual data. So if you have an IP address, a file hash, a binary, uh, a PDF report, all of these kind of things, uh, they are considered as data and we save them into one of these elements that you have uh, on screen. Uh, but this data is just contains information, but it doesn't have the context. So it doesn't say what it is. So is it a C2 server? Uh, is it uh, which techniques are used by the attacker to uh, to, to use the, this uh, uh, this URL and so on? And all of this context uh, is attached to what we call the context layer, and is basically just tags. But now for these tags, they are coming from different sources. Uh, Alex already mentioned the taxonomy, so we'll see quickly uh, where these tags uh, where they come from and how you can use them. But first, let's have a look first at the data layer. And we'll start with attributes. Uh, so attributes, they are really the most basic building blocks uh, that we have uh, in MISP. They just hold the, the raw information. Uh, so you see in the use cases uh, point, uh, you have an example about domain, IP, link, Shawan attachment, and so on. So all of these, like truly the data that you will use, uh, is stored as an attribute. Now we have something that we distinguish between, uh, if you're familiar with sticks, indicator and observable. Uh, but in MISP, we have a different terminology. Uh, it's basically indicator or supporting data. Uh, it's almost similar. Uh, the only, well, the main difference that we have in MISP is uh, an attribute is one of the two, but they can switch from one category to the other, depending on just one flag that is called the two IDS flag. So the two IDS flag is uh, a short end for two intrusion detection system, uh, where it's just the, the, the idea is if, if an attribute that contains information is meant to be fed to a protective tool, such as an IDS system, a SIM, and so on, you will turn that flag on. If it's not the case, well, you, you turn it off. So to give an example, if you have uh, malware that check if it, had, if it has internet connectivity by pinging the IP address 8888, and then if it does, tries to access like a, a link uh, to download its malware configuration, uh, then you have, two, you have two attributes. You have the 8888 and um, 8888 IP address, but you also have the, the, the URL. But you don't want to block uh, 8888. You just want to, to keep this information contained uh, for uh, your intelligence uh, analyst, because it's interesting to see the behavior that this malware tries to uh, detect if it has internet connectivity first. But you don't want to block 8888. Uh, so for these two attributes, you will turn off the IDS flag for 8888, but you will turn on the IDS flag for the malicious uh, URL. So that's basically the idea. So that was for attributes. 
Now we have another structure uh, that we call MISP object. And it's basically another block that reuse these attributes to create something that, uh, that have a meaning that makes sense when you group them together. Um, so the use cases that you can see, we have five person credit card to, to spend a bit uh, of time on the file one. For a file, a file has a file name, the, the binary representation, different file hashes, a size, and so on. All of these, are actually attributes. So you would have, uh, for each file hashes, you would have an attribute. Uh, for, the, um, for the binary, you would have another attribute. For the file size, another attribute. But all of these attributes, they are basically representing one concept, which is a file. So you can group them into what we call a MISP object. Um, yeah, so you see objects are more at they are slightly more advanced uh, data structure. And nowadays, I think uh, attributes uh, just alone without being part of an object are starting to disappear because you will quickly notice during the demo uh, that uh, we tend to create objects every time because it, it, it makes more sense. But you will see. Uh, yeah, you will see during the demo. Uh, about that uh, small aspect. Something that is worth, uh, worth mentioning, mentioning here is that, uh, as Alex already mentioned, these concepts, even if we don't have them created by default in MISP, you can always create a new one. So Alex was mentioning car plates, he was uh, mentioning person, uh, but we had uh, the example, uh, I would say months or maybe years now uh, ago, that uh, an organization wanted to express seized good on the border uh, and so it's extremely easy to do because MISP objects are coming from a template and the only thing that you need to, to do is to describe that template, describe what type of attributes uh, are valid for that specific object and then there you have it, you have uh, something that MISP can work on and a concept that MISP can work on. So to continue we have MISP event. So if you look on the diagram on the right side, you see that we have attributes, that multiple attributes that can be contained inside an event, and also multiple MISP objects that can be contained inside an event. Basically, events are just an envelope that holds data that are contextually linked together. Uh, typical use case, if you have an incident, you will create an event that will contain all the indicators and all the uh, supporting data that, is, that are linked to this incident. If you have a report from an antivirus vendor, for example, you would create an event that would contain all of this information. Uh, so it's just uh, a way to group data that belong to a specific uh, event. That's why we call them event. Um, something that is also interesting to note is all attributes and all objects are always contained inside one event. You, you can't have an attribute floating without being part of an event. So all the data that you have are always contained inside one event. Um, yeah, so these events that contain attribute, object, and also event report that we'll cover in a, in a minute. And this is actually right now, so MISP event report. Uh, so you can see also on the right side that an event can contain multiple event reports. Uh, event report are meant for human, uh, it's just a way for analysts uh, or users that encode the information to have uh, a way to, to, to write things, like to, to describe a story using text and not using formatted data structure. Uh, so these reports are marked on aware, so you can add a bit of formatting. And we have also included a special syntax that allows you to reference some MISP entities. So if you want to reference a specific file, if you want to specific a specific uh, URL and so on, uh, you can do that directly in the report. Uh, yeah, usually you would use them to write technical uh, uh, summary, to, to write executive summary, or to describe processes, step that uh, an attacker took, uh, behaviors and so on. So things that it's harder to describe using formatted data structure, but it's more e e it's easier to do uh, with text, basically. The only thing to keep in mind is they are meant for human, not for machine. 
And now on the opposite side, if you want to express and describe stories, but that are meant for machine, in this case, you would use object references. So object references are basically a relationship that you can use to link building blocks together. So to link attribute and object together or object and object. Uh, so with this, you can create connect, uh, you can create a connected graph where you would have acting as nodes, the different attribute and object and as edges, the, the relationship or the object reference. Uh, so to give an example, this is a small uh, graph that you have on inside one event that uses these object references. So in this case, we have a, a file uh, that drops using an object reference, you can see the relation, uh, another file, which is an NCTOR malware. And this malware drops another malware, which is a Zeus Panda bank. And this last file connects to uh, that IP address. So by using these object references, you, you see two things. First, you have created a connected graph that can be used by machine. Uh, and the second one is immediately by looking at this graph and analysis, understand what's going on. So you see direct, uh, directly that this file was downloaded first and it was attached in this, uh, in this page. Uh, and then this file downloaded another one and the second file downloaded the third one. So by just looking at this graph, you immediately get what's going on. So using object references can be proved useful, especially if you want to describe these kind of stories. So to have a global view of everything that we've talked about, uh, we have this anatomy of an event. So this is the whole event. So you have a bit of information about the event. Uh, so for example, who, who owns the event, how this information should be uh, distributed uh, and visualized by other uh, organization on your MISP instance. Um, then we have something that we haven't talked about yet. It is the context layer, so the taxonomies and galaxies. And then the, how we like to call it, intelligent visualization widgets. Uh, it's basically the event graph, so viewing the relationship between the entities, the timeline that uses the time component of these entities to, to create a, a timeline, and also all event reports that were created on this event. And last but not least, the actual data, so a table containing all the attributes and a table containing all the objects that you have saved inside your event. Okay, now that we've seen how you can encode information using the different data structures that you have, let's see how you can add context to them. So we've already quickly uh, mentioned that um, in MISP, all context and all contextualization is done, is done by using tags. Uh, and these tags are coming from three different sources. So the first one is the free tags. So a tag can be set without any restriction. You can, if you want to, to, to create a tag named uh, my super tag, you can do it. This allows you to do that uh, and you can use it right away. But we see that it's not always a good idea to do that. And then we have two other sources, uh, namely the taxonomies and the galaxies. Uh, and you will see the difference and in which case it's better to use one or the other. But first, let's start with the free tags. Uh, I mentioned they can be useful, but it's on very specific, uh, let's say, on a very specific scope or context. Uh, because as we can see on the small screenshot, which is taken from a misp instance you are currently running, uh, well, the human mind can be very creative to express the same context, uh, concept, sorry. Uh, but using different representation. Uh, so I guess you are all familiar with TLP Ember. Uh, and if you let users create whatever they want, this is what you will end up with. So if you are used to creating automation, doing some exporting based on tags and so on, you quickly realize that this can be a nightmare to deal with. Uh, and it makes automation difficult but also understanding can be also difficult. Uh, for this simple example with TLP, it's kind of easier because you know what TLP stands for and you know what Ember also, uh, the same for Ember. But if you start to have more complex, uh, complex uh, tags, then it's becoming trickier to understand what they actually mean. So 
to tackle this issue, we created what we call the taxonomies. So as Alex already mentioned in the introduction, this is a standardized set of vocabularies uh, where everything is normalized. Uh, you have a small description of each of these tags uh, so that nobody gets confused what they mean. And it really is that automation because they all look the same. Uh, and as they're all the same, you can quickly create your filters. So this is an example, not for TLP, but this time for another taxonomy uh, that is called workflow state. Uh, so with this taxonomy, you can express the state of an event. So if you are currently encoding something, or if you are currently working on an incident, you would call it either draft or ongoing or incomplete. And if you are done with that and everything is ready to be published and shared with partners, then you, you can put it as complete. So that was for uh, taxonomies. Now let's have a look at galaxies. So you can see galaxies a bit like taxonomies, but on steroids. So it's also a normalized set of vocabularies that has, they, they have descriptions, but they have more than just one description. They can have additional information attached to it. So um, what you are currently looking at is the galaxy uh, thread actor, and you are looking at the galaxy cluster APT29. So the APT29 thread actor. And for that thread actor, we have additional information. They are, all, they are not all displayed, but this is just a subset of what, what we know about this APT29 thread actor. But you can see that we can save that um, the sponsor state, the suspected sponsor state is, the, is Russia. We have uh, the attribution confidence of 50 out of 100. Uh, we have some suspected victim of that thread actor and we have more information associated to it. And in addition to that, we can also create relationship between these galaxy clusters. Uh, so the APT29 thread actor from the thread actor galaxy, which uh, we have on, on the center here, uh, we also have the same, uh, the same concept, but in this, this time in another galaxy coming from Maitre, so the Maitre Enterprise Attack Intrusion set. And what we have created there is a link saying that this thread actor is actually similar to this one with a probability that is set to likely. And, and so with this, you can also create uh, automation and try to, uh, when you create your filterings and so on, use this, this information to, to extrapolate more data and extrapolate more knowledge about the data you are dealing with. Uh, just a side note, um, my tree attack framework is fully supported by MISP. And the concept we use to represent these different techniques and so on is galaxies. Not taxonomies, we use galaxies because with that we can provide references to the, the, to the actual Maitre web pages, uh, mitigation techniques, uh, techniques used by some thread actor that we know, uh, and plenty of other things actually. Like the, the matrix representation of the attack framework is also done thanks to this uh, additional meta information. All right, and last point that I want to cover is uh, one slide about correlation, well, actually two. Uh, is how correlation are created in MISP and how do they work. So correlation um, are a bit different than relationship. In MISP, when you create a relationship, remember, this is a relationship. A relationship are created manually, so or with a script. Uh, so when you want to relate two uh, entities together, you would create a relationship. But the correlation, on the other hand, they are created automatically. So as soon as you have two attributes that have the same value, for example, the same file hash or the same domain, the same URL, MISP will detect that and will automatically, automatically create a link between these two. So that when you are exploring an event, you can see, oh, okay, this, uh, this uh, file hash has been used in another event or in another incident. And so you can pivot from this attribute to the other one and see how they are related. And um, yeah, last slide about correlation is um, how are correlation created? Well, they are created based on the attribute value, but only if these attributes belong to two different events. So if you create an incident and you create an attribute that point to 
a domain. Uh, if you have two, twice the same domain in the, in the same event, then a correlation link will not be created. However, if you have the same attribute value contained in another event, then a correlation link will be created. So we have three types of correlation link. The first one is the string value. Uh, so that's how we call it. So if an attribute has the exact same value as another one, you would have a correlation link created. Um, so this is pretty straightforward. The second one is with CIDR blocks. So if you, in one of the events, create a CIDR block, so an IP range, um, and on another event, you create a, an IP that is contained inside this IP range, then a correlation link will be created automatically. And the last point is with uh, SSD, so fuzzy, fuzzy hashing. Uh, so if you encode a binary that is somehow similar based on some threshold that you can set on the configuration to another uh, binary contained inside another event, then a correlation link will be also created. OK. And I think that's basically it for the data structure. Uh, but now I would like to mention something that we haven't mentioned that much is distribution. So I will spend like two minutes to explain the different distribution that we have and how it's working in this. So let's bring the slide deck. So in MISP, we have a multiple distribution level going from very restrictive to very lax. So let's start with the most restrictive one and go up to the, the laxer one. Um, so the first one is uh, organization only. So this means if you create data under the organization only distribution setting, only users from your organization can see the data. So to take the example of uh, our MISP instance for the private sector, we have, uh, as Alex mentioned, more than 1,500 organizations over there. Uh, they all have multiple users. And so if one of these users create an event under the organization only, only the user from that organization can see the data. Then we have this community only. Uh, we consider a MISP instance as a community. So in our case, if, we, if a user uh, from that miss for the private sector who were to create an event under the this community distribution setting, then all organization from that instance would be able to see the data. And then we have connected communities. So it's like a, uh, it inherits the previous distribution. So in our case, all users from the instance for the private sector can see the data, uh, but the data will also be synchronized with other miss instances. And then we have all communities. Uh, it means that basically the same as connected communities, but the distribution will be shared uh, on other MISP instance nodes. So to illustrate the difference between these two, uh, we have this small diagram where the different boxes represent MISP instances and the arrows represent the fact that they are connected. They have a synchronization link. So if we start from the gray MISP instance, you see this community uh, means that the data under the this community will not be synchronized to other MISP instances. However, if you use the connected communities distribution setting, then data will be able to flow only one node away. So we can see it goes to the red and the yellow, but it doesn't go further. So the, the green and the purple MISP, so they don't get the data. Uh, and last but not least, the all communities means that it will be propagated as far as it can get in the network topology that we have there. So this is the distinction. And the last thing that we didn't cover is the sharing groups. Sharing groups are just basically a distribution list where you can enumerate the different organizations that can see the data. And then once the data is shared, uh, only these organizations can see the data, only the organization listed in the sharing group. Uh, so in this diagram, we have a small example with the blue sharing group, where you can see that these organizations can see the data, but not these two. And these distribution settings really offer a lot of granularity of 
uh, where you can set it. So you will be able to set this distribution setting on the event, so on the envelope, but you can also select the distribution setting for each individual attribute and object that you have in your event. So that you can say, okay, this whole event, uh, this whole incident that you have, uh, it can be shared with everyone unless the victim or unless internal references to our ticketing system or some specific internal IOC that we don't want to disclose. So you have a lot of control of how the data can be shared and visualized by other organization. Okay, so I think we uh, we cover a lot of topic. Um, so maybe it would be a great time to do a small break. Yeah. Um, right before we do the, the the best practices and also the demo and calling. Should we do five minutes? Uh, yeah, we can do five minute break. Yeah, and then so that means uh, we will start back at ten forty five. Sounds good. Thank you. So see you in five minutes. And don't drink too much coffee. Thank you. <laughs>
I think it's time to, to get back. Uh, yeah, uh, once again, I would like to mention the, the, the cheat sheet. So if you ever need to get reminded of anything or to get a quick summary of what was seen in the previous presentation, well, this is the place to go. Uh, you can also print it and pin it on, on, on the wall next to you. Or it's great to have that at hand. All right. Um, so I can close that. Um, usually, we like to do this uh, recommendation and best practices when encoding data after we do the demo. Uh, but this time, we do it the other way around so that when I will do the demo, you will see that I will try to follow all of these commandments. Uh, and it's always good to have them in mind before we start. Um, so let's try this this way around this time. All right, so this small presentation will show like 10 best practices on how it's better to encode the, the information. So it pre pretty much gives uh, guidelines on what is good to do, what is not good to do. Um, so that you can get the most of your information, but also you enable partners and others, collaborators and so on, to get the most off of what you produce. Uh, and if they also do the same, well, you also benefit from that. So it, it's just like some good example that you can do. And most of the time, people try to imitate what others are also doing. So it's, it's always good to, to benefit. So. Let's get started. Um, yeah, slide notes where this information comes from. So we have uh, best practices in intelligence. This is a document that we have on the website. You can get, uh, you can get it on that URL. Um, and another slide deck that were used, that was used to, to generate these, uh, these uh, best practices. Uh, you can also get, get it from that URL. Uh, yeah. Once again, all the slides that are presented today, they are also available on the training document, so you can click, the, click that and, and download them. All right, so first, when you create uh, information, you know that you always have to uh, create an event first, because you cannot have floating attribute or floating object, they are always contained inside one event. Uh, and something that you should really strive to do is to uh, describe that envelope in a concise and self-explanatory manner. Because this envelope is meant for human, and so when they will browse a MISP instant, that's what they will see immediately. So this is a good and bad example. So for example, we have an event that, were called, that was called failed spear phishing attempt targeting telco company in Luxembourg. Maybe it's a bit too much information, but at least when you read that, you immediately see what's going on. So you see, okay, this incident involves spear phishing. You also know that it was a failed one. Uh, you also know the, the sector. You also know the, the targeted country. All of this information, you get it by just reading that. Uh, if you look at the, another example about the exact same incident, just seeing phishing, okay, you know it's phishing, but then what? So if you can use uh, a concise and self-explanatory -like title, it really facilitates your life because when you will revisit your data, you know what it will be about, but also you facilitate the life of the recipient. Maybe some, something, I would say, good stories that we had uh, in the past. Um, we, we have seen some um, sharing communities starting uh, to share information and so on and adding the event info and so on without really not taking too much care about what is inside the event info. Um, and uh, I remember a case where we were seeing like uh, um, event info tickets uh, dash uh, with a number and the values, uh, so which was at the end for the, share, the members of the sharing community is kind of difficult to figure out what it was all about. Um, so nothing blocked you to add the ticket ID somewhere in the info at the end, for example, or at the beginning, what you, because maybe some of your own organization might know about it. But the other in the sharing communities didn't know about it. Um, so it's, it's a quick win. So uh, um, usually try to be concise, obviously. But if you need to add a ticket reference, something that is all obviously known by a small subset of your group, just add it maybe at the end and uh, the generic information and so on. Um, make it prominent at the beginning uh, 
it, it's, it sounds like, I would say, obvious, but for a lot of sharing communities, the issue is still, still sometimes the case. Yeah, that's very, that's very, bo uh, very good uh, tip. Um, another one that uh, Alex was mentioning, ticket. I think if you have time constraint and you want to encode things quickly, putting it in the title does the job. Uh, but the, the better way to do it would be to create an attribute, uh, being uh, the ticket ID, but then restrict the distribution setting of that ticket to only the subset of organization that can use that ticket ID or that can have access to that ticket ID. So, so that would be the, the better use, but it takes more time, obviously. But it's indeed a very good point because then you can start to automate back on the ticket ID. Uh, so if you need to reference it back later on. Um, so for example, there's a, for the one using a request tracker, uh, incident response, uh, RTIR, uh, there's still, um, I think there's an uh, RTIR object uh, in MISP uh, where you can basically describe the ticket and so on. So uh, you see that more you structure the information, the more it's easy. So um, if you have something in the event title, obviously be sure that is at least repercuted inside um, inside the uh, uh, event. So that means if you have information about spear phishing and so on, add galaxies, object, and so on. Same for ticket ID. If you have a ticket ID, like Sammy was mentioning, which is a very good point, um, add an object with that reference. So like that, you have indeed uh, an easy readable versions of the event info directly and at the same time you have uh, parsable machine readable information in the event uh, and then you can use it all right so let's go to the second commandment and this one uh, that not everyone will agree with uh, is to take your time to properly encode data and i think most of the time people don't really agree about the time component because everyone is always in a rush. They want to do things fast. They want to, to be done with the encoding because this is an annoying task. Um, but it is extremely important to, to do it correctly, at least at the beginning, so that you really understand how it should be done. Because once you know how it should be done, then you can start automating it. Uh, we'll show an example uh, today during the demo where if you start to encode a lot of URL, uh, it takes time to do, to extract the different component. Maybe you can do something to make that job a bit faster. And you, you will see that we have plenty of mechanism in MISP, MISP that can help you for that. Um, so properly encoding data, it's, it's, also, it's about context, but it's also about the data structure and data type. Uh, so in MISP, if you want, you can encode everything uh, as an attribute with a text type and a uh, comment category. So you can add anything like this, uh, like a free text, basically. Uh, it works, but it's not useful. Uh, so if you, if you want to do things properly, if you have a file hash encoding, for example, MD5 hash, encoding as an MD5 attribute. Uh, if you have an URL encoding as an URL attribute. So it's a bit, it takes a bit of time, but it's extremely valuable to have that, especially when you want to uh, export things. Oh, so we have on the slide, think machine. Um, it's all, always about exports, especially if you want to feed your productive tools. Uh, you don't feed tools with junk, you feed tools with actionable, potentially vetted data. Uh, and so to extract this information from your MISP instance, it's way easier if you have things properly set and properly saved. Uh, and for the human, again, uh, if the human doesn't understand, how can the machine? Um, uh, yeah, so it also say that that's what everyone see and what this is what they will get notified about. So when you publish something in MISP, um, if you have subscribed to the notification uh, system, then you will receive an email that will describe what was published and what was made available by you or by a, a a partner or collaborator. So if the encoding is not done properly, well, it's it's basically junk because the uh, the recipient cannot read it or cannot understand what this is about. Well, it's not useful. Okay. Another commitment is to prefer the usage of object rather than attributes. Um, so. This one might be a bit surprising for some of you, but you will see that it makes a lot of sense. 
So we've already mentioned that object allows you to express and to represent concept. So we've seen an example for file. Um, what we have on this, uh, on this first point is a new URL. So on the right side, you see we have the full URL, we have the domain that is extracted, the query string of that URL, the scheme, and so on. Now, if you look at the left side, this is what an event would look like if you would not use an object. So you see we have some URL there, we have an IP, we have a domain somewhere. So they're all mixed, and you don't really know what belongs to what. Uh, so using object may, makes things more readable. Something that is also quite important is this relationship that we've covered previously that allows you to create relationship between entities, effectively creating connected graph that tells a story. Um, in MISP, there is a small limitation, and it's, maybe it's on purpose, maybe it's not. We don't really agree in the team, um, but only objects can create relationship. So you can create a relationship between one object uh, so let's say this one, from one object to another object, from one object to an attribute, but you cannot create a relationship from an attribute to an object. So this is a limitation um, that we have. So if you want to be sure to always be able to express any kind of relationship, create it, create your data as an object. Uh, an object doesn't necessarily mean uh, or necessar necessarily have to have multiple attributes, an object can only contain one attribute. So in the URL object, if you were to only add that URL attribute, it would work and it would be fine. It's just that you can get more data and get more information out of your data if you create a full object, especially when you rely on correlation. So, so, so where, where, when you are in doubt, um, create an object? If you don't exactly know, uh, should I do an attribute? Should I do an object? Pick an object first. Um, uh, we'll show you a quick trick uh, today. Uh, if you don't exactly know which object to choose, you can even create an attribute, then select and create an object out of it. And MISP will try to guess which kind of object it is. So even if you go from an attribute because you do like, I don't know, quick free text import, an import of CSV and so on uh, during, I don't know, an exercise or during whatever things and so on, just um, select the attribute and then create an object and automatically will uh, propose you an object. And usually it's quite good. 90% of the time is giving you the right, the right object, uh, I guess. Um, so obviously good even nowadays, if you look at uh, sharing communities, are the one where you basically just have object, even report and so on, and you basically have no attributes. Uh, the one that are, I would say, less contextualized and so on have usually a lot of attributes and, and very less object. Um, so using object is really the uh, the thing to to I would say if you have to to memorize something from this slide, use object. Yeah, exactly. Um, there are two other points that are also worth keeping in mind. Well, the first one is to use object, obviously. Um, but if you try to create connected graph. Uh, you will see how we can do it during the demo. But uh, there are list of predefined uh, verb that you can use. It's better to use one of these lists rather than create a new one. It's easier for automation. All right. Now, another point that is also important to keep in mind is to review the state of the IDS and correlation flags. So if you remember, at the beginning, we explained that an attribute can be either an indicator of compromise or an observable or so-called supporting data. And this all depends based on the state of the two IDS flag. So basically, if it's set, if the, the flag is set, it means that this data should be fed to productive tool and this uh, can be used for automation. If it's not, well, it's supporting data. Uh, so before uh, marking an event to be ready to be consumed, uh, make sure to review these two flags. So you see on, the, on this table, you have the correlate um, colon and you have the IDS colon. Uh, so if we have a quick look at uh, some example, uh, you can see that the file name, which is very weird, it's uh, like, uh, it seems to be like uh, 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 SHA-256H, uh, you see that the IDS flag is checked uh, because 
if another file has the same file name, then in this case, uh, well, uh, that's for correlate. So that means if uh, we a file is named with that uh, name, then it would trigger a warning uh, or it would be blocked depending on your, the policy you set. Uh, we have the same for the different uh, file hashes. So if it is detected, then uh, it, it would be blocked. Uh, but for example, the entropy of a file or even the size, the size, it doesn't make sense to block a file that have the exact same size. So in this case, it's, it's always good <clears throat> to, to check these. Uh, by default, MISP already has some same default. So all of these are actually set by default. So you don't have to, to manually take care of them. But in some cases, it makes sense to, uh, to modify the IDS column or also the correlate column. So now to have a quick look at the correlation column, uh, correlating on the size in back. So creating links saying that, okay, this file has the exact same size of this one. It doesn't really make sense to do, but to do it, for example, on file hash is to say, oh, okay, so this file hash is, so that means this exact binary was used in another incident or was used in another blog post described by the non tavares vendor. This is valuable information. So once again, it takes time to review the correlation table uh, correlation column uh, to express the fact that this attribute should it correlate or should it not. Once again, MISP has some same default, but sometimes you want to modify them. Just one thing regarding IDS, um, um, because there is this terminology about indicator of compromise. Um, technically, when you have a, an IDS set, it's obviously an indicator of compromise. It's something that you can detect, use, and so on. Uh, if we take the terminology of sticks, uh, technically, IDS flag set is an indicator. So if you unset the IDS flag, it's basically an observable. Uh, in MISP, it's exactly the same. So it's basically a context uh, telling you some things like, uh, Sammy was mentioning the entropy, which is a very interesting value for an analyst. Uh, you can see that, for example, oh, is this uh, portable executable sections compressed or not or encrypted, and the entropy is giving you the ends. On the other hand, the value by itself is not something that you can use an indicator of compromise because you might have other uh, P executable with exactly the same entropy value. So it's not an indicator per se, but it's really an observable that you can use for contextualization and so on. So don't hesitate to, uh, like Sammy was mentioning, to unset set ideas to review it. To review it. Um, if you're in doubt and you think that it might generate false positive and so on, maybe unset the ideas. And there is a command field for each of the attributes in the object. If you have a doubt and you need to describe it, don't hesitate to describe it. For example, I didn't set the IDS flag because I know that, for example, the file test.txt is used everywhere and this will generate false positive, for example. So I unset it. So like that, you have the reasoning behind why there is no IDS flags. And same for correlations. If you think that it doesn't make sense to correlate, just uh, remove it. OK. Another very and extremely important point uh, that we never emphasize enough is to contextualize your data. Um, so we have multiple points on which you can attach contextualization. So you can attach context on the event, but you can also attach context on the attributes uh, and so on. Um, so what are we really recommend is always to start with the event because that's what is displayed immediately uh, to the users when they log in. That's also what they will be notified about. Uh, so you can see on the right side, a small example of something that was taken from one of our instances. You can see on the, the top, we have uh, an event that is quite well contextualized. So we know the sector, we know the country, we know the, the, the target uh, country. Uh, we know some attack pattern that were used by the attacker to, to achieve their goal and, and some more information about releaseability, permissible action, uh, the kind of phishing technique that were used. Uh, well, a lot of information that you can use uh, with automation. <laughs> with that, you can also do a lot of things like trendings, say, uh, the trend landscape reporting, uh, fine tuning the, your export, indicator lifecycle management lot of benefit to do it. On the other hand, if you look at the bad example, well, it's not that bad because you also you already have the TLP, so it's already something. You also know that this is OSINT 
uh, so open source trade intelligence. Uh, but that's basically it. So you don't have much information. You don't know what type of event, what type of incident, if it is an incident, uh, what type of techniques, who was targeted. So you have none of this information. So it's harder to automate. There is something so, interesting looking at the, at the screenshot. Um, imagine that you have access to such an event, but not any object, no any event report. You just have that. And just by looking at this, you can immediately spot what it's all about in the first one. Okay, it's, it's a spear phishing, it's targeting Luxembourg, it's in the telecom sector. You can even run statistics. I'm, I'm sure that a regulator will, will love to have such kind of data. Even if it's not the actual data, it's a contextualization. So think about that too. Sometimes uh, organizations and users might only be interested in the contextualization and not the actual data. Uh, to run statistics, risk assessment, things like that, or reporting, uh, compared to the other one where you have indeed some tags there, but it doesn't give you a lot of insight about what's inside. And if you do statistics on TLP-wide classifications, okay, that's nice. But obviously, it's much better when you have a, a country target, uh, even the Maitre attack patterns, and so on. So sometimes even contextualization alone is really, really interesting. Um. To continue on that aspect, so these are contexts that were attached to an event, but you can even go further and also attach the concept, uh, the context on attribute. Uh, some example, if you have an IP address or domain name or an URL that you know is acting as the C2 server, just attach a C2 tag on it so that when you view the event, you immediately see, okay, this is the C2. Uh, same for uh, the technique use. If the URL is an exfiltration URL, attach this information. So if I wanted to show like uh, something, let's say that, uh, I don't know, we would know that um, uh, this, this URL that we have there uh, is one delivering one payload, attach a tag so that you can easily filter it out. Um, if you know that I don't know, this URL is an exfiltration point for credential, attach it. So we realize it takes time, obviously. Um, so, once again, it's better if you automate things, um, uh, but yeah, in case where time is critical for you and you have very a good amount of time constraint, uh, then we provide this small table, uh, which gives you like a um, priority whenever you want to contextualize. So, in my opinion, maybe that's up to debate, but this is just my opinion. I think uh, when you want to add context, saying who can view the data and what they can do with it is one of the most important thing. So using TLP taxonomy and the PEP taxonomy is almost a, a must, I would say, for everything that you create. Um, then uh, attaching information about the, the behavior of the attacker, the attack they use and so on, using the attack Maitre uh, framework, always good to do. Um, then if it's not described, well enough, or if you have more time, uh, you can also specify what kind of uh, event we are dealing with. Is it an incident? Is it a report? Is it a trend landscape report? Is it a summary? Is it a daily dump? Is it in the sandbox execution? You have plenty of things that you can describe there. Uh, and if you are dealing with malware, what type of malware? If you are dealing with an incident, what type of incident? Is it a ransomware? Is it, uh, is it spam? Is it uh, uh, spear phishing and so on? So another commandment is uh, to use taxonomy and galaxy. So basically to use normalized vocabulary. Uh, we already talked about why it's uh, extremely important to do and not use free tags, because if you use them, everyone understands the same thing because you're speaking the same language basically. And it makes automation way, way easier. Uh, another point that was also mentioned is that it simplified the life of uh, any recipient. But something that we didn't really mention is um, how do you use that in a community? So the best to do is to take some time with the community or take the lead up to you to agree on which taxonomy, which vocabulary to use. Uh, so I guess TLP would be like common denominator for many everyone. Uh, but maybe not in every case. Uh, like I know we have some specific uh, taxonomy for uh, for NATO classification, 
Uh, maybe this one, I don't know if it can replace TLP, uh, but at least it can be used along. Uh, same goes for galaxies. So as long as you use them, it's great. But if you start using the same, because we have multiple taxonomies and galaxies that express the same thing, uh, well, it's, it's better to always use the same and keep using them. Okay. Another one. Uh, and we have... Maybe one, one point if you go back to the. Just, uh, sure. Sorry for Absolutely. that. Um, but um, indeed, for the recipient, it's, it's super important. If it's normalized, it's easy and so on. You see the mess with TLP. It's, 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 it's exactly why we created taxonomics. But this uh, an additional benefit, which is super interesting, and we see it in the screenshot, is automatically we get statistics where the taxonomy is used and so on. Um, so keep using it. Uh, because you'll see that when you start to have to do uh, reporting after like multiple days of, I don't know, exercise, uh, uh, new incidents, things like that, you, you want to generate it automatically and, 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 and be sure that you tag everything. So you want to know the number of events that you have, the one that are probably tags with specific galaxies and so on. Uh, it's a quick win. Um, so even if it costs like two or three seconds more to add a tags, this is valuable at the end and it's basically a quick gain uh, for everyone. Good point. Okay, so to come back on, on this commandment about adding time component on entities, um, we have multiple ways to, to add time information on, on elements. So we can set a first scene, you can set a last scene. This, this can be useful, for example, if you want to describe that a server was up and running during this time period. But you also have the sightings. So sightings, they are a way to notify that you've seen this. So if you are seeing, uh, if your seam or radius or whatever detects something, then you can feed back that information to MISP uh, so that MISP can do some lifecycle management. Um, and also like prioritize some attributes based on their activity. Um, so if you had any of these type, the time component or the three of them, it's even better, then you can get automatic timelines for free, so as you can see on the left screenshot. So you see that a mail was sent at that specific time. Then later on, a registry key was added for persistence. Uh, later on, a public key was downloaded. So the malware configuration were downloaded. And it was done. All of this information was downloaded uh, from that IP address. So just looking at the timeline, you can deduce already what's going on. Um, yeah, and last but not least is uh, if you want to use the lifecycle management system, IOC lifecycle management system attempt that we have in MISP to prioritize some attributes to be fed to your protective tool, then uh, as this system heavily relies on this time component, then it's better to have them, obviously. Yeah, M maybe something to add. Um, and that's, I think I would say my main frustration for the past years is a lot of, um, incident report and especially a blog post and reporting from trade intelligence companies doesn't contain any first scene, last scene. Um, so which is challenging because if you start to encode information and you don't have any time component, it's basically wild guess. But MISP uh, is trying to help you there um, because when you encode information to MISP, um, the time set will be the time set of the encoding. Uh, and then there's a trick there. Uh, I'll give you that trick because I'm using it quite a lot. Uh, very often, I the sequence of event is uh, starting from the beginning until the end in a document. So if you do the recording and you encode it in that way, you basically have the timeline. Even if you don't have the exact time, you still have the sequence of event, which is useful for forensic analysis or investigations. Uh, so keep that in mind. If you don't have the first scene, last scene during an incident or a colleague just tell you, okay, I've seen this first and then that and that and that, that's fine. But just encode it in that uh, order then you will automatically benefit from the timeline because it will be the encoded time. Yeah, that was a, a good tip. Uh, and you will see it in action during the, the small demo. Um, yeah, checks the warning list and correlation it's. So Alex already mentioned multiple times the warning list. Uh, and basically these are lists that can be used to uh, show warnings or even avoid some common false positive. Uh, and I think one of the most 
uh, useful case is to filter out these false positives so that you don't feed false positive to, to your protective tools and thus making your sort or any partners angry or unhappy that you were blocking like false positive, for example, Facebook and stuff like that. Imagine if you block Facebook in your company. So yeah, <clears throat> um, and same goes for correlation. It's uh, but in a different way because if you have a correlation, that can mean two things. So either one, you get more hint about what is correlating. So you see, okay, this IP address was contained was referenced in another incident. You have the context of that other incident, so you can deduce more information about what's going on but you can also use it to detect false positives. So if you have a correlation with, for example, uh, a feed that lists all the Tor exit nodes, well, you know, okay, this one may be a false positive. And so you can turn the IDS off. So what you are seeing on the screen right now is combination of both uh, these uh, warning and correlation hits. So you see on these attributes, uh, we have checked the IDS flags meaning that this IP address should be fed to our productive tool. And MISP warns us that this IP address is part of a list of known IPv4 public DNS resolver, and thus it's most probably a false positive. And for the correlation, you see we have a registry key that saves information about the version of a specific uh, malware. Uh, and then we have correlation with two events. And we could pivot on this event and view what's going on. Why is this uh, registry key used? How is it used? Uh, what it is used for? And so you can extract and uh, deduce more knowledge about that. Uh, okay, if I can add something there, maybe. Sure, go ahead. Um, in the warning list, there's a, a small, uh, I would say, um, um, feature that is called category. Um, and that's maybe useful for, for some of you when, when you basically have a MISP and you need to, to be sure that you have false positive coming from non-infrastructures, but you might want to um, have a specific category that is not really triggering a false positive, but more triggering that is a non-infrastructures. Um, and in your MISP instance, uh, you can specify the category of the warning list. So by default, it's false, uh, false positive, but as an example, a circle, we have uh, our own infrastructures as a warning list. Uh, so like that, we get a warning, whatever the IDS flag is set, just that, okay, to warn the analyst that, oh, this information might be important because it's maybe your infrastructure. So if you, as a SOC, CERT, whatever, um, you are protecting infrastructures, don't hesitate to create custom warning list. Uh, you can do it from the user interface uh, with a special category called uh, non-infrastructures uh, non um, because it's basically an easy way to... Uh, to spot things that you might uh, know as non-identifiers and you need to, uh, to analyze it uh, further on. Let's move to the next one, <clears throat> which is about event report. So these, um, they were not really used that much, but uh, in the past few months, we are seeing uh, a small increase of the event report usage. Um, even though that cannot be used by automation systems, so you cannot really automate it because if you remember event report are meant for human, uh, they can really help anyone that want to get more information about an event or an incident or a report to understand what's going on. Uh, so in this one, you are seeing uh, the technical details about the ransomware, so you see, uh, in a text manner, you have how the, the victim was infected, so what was the infection vector, how the execution and the persistence were, were done, and so on. So creating these, uh, they don't necessarily need to, to be that complex or that uh, full-featured, um, but at least providing like the source where this information came from, or, or even the original blog post, or the original uh, report, and so on, it's really... Uh, important, I think, because you always can, you know the source, you know all the data, you know all the story behind what you are currently dealing with. There is something interesting with the event report, and take an example of how we use it uh, internally. Um, very often that the recipient of an event might be of different, I would say, a field of expertise or having different capabilities. Um, and it's not uncommon that we create, for example, a complete event with object and so on, and we create multiple event reports. 
And for example, we have uh, we we are used to create, for example, um, an event report, which is, for example, an executive summary, which just contains the descriptions of the overall techniques or the overall uh, incident or event, whatever. And then we have an event report, which is more details and more, for example, for a forensic analysis uh, analyst. So um, in this case, um, that's quite interesting because then you can really have two kind of, of event report or multiple one uh, targeting different audience. Uh, and you can even set the distribution level on different level. Uh, so you can have a, a complete detailed report with a lot of forensic details containing a lot of private information or personal identifiable data there compared to just an executive summary that you want to share with everyone. So uh, like Sami was mentioning, it's, it's indeed quite new. We see more and more uh, uh, sharing communities using uh, event report. And nowadays, even multiple event reports, depending on the target audience. So uh, don't hesitate to do that um, if you need to have kind of summary and then to have a more detailed report for uh, investigation or analysis. Great. Uh, yeah, okay. And I think this is the last one, if I'm not mistaken, is to review the distribution of your event and also a child element such as attribute and object. And once you are done, publish the event. So what I mean by review the distribution is to avoid basically leaking information that any other organization or recipient should receive. Uh, and for example, could be uh, potential victims. So if you have listed names, uh, maybe not do that. Um, well, you do it for your event, but then you restrict the distribution level for these. Uh, same for internal references. So Alex was mentioned, we, we were mentioning actually, uh, ticket ID. So it's always good to keep track of that uh, so that you can save them in, inside your event. You can even have some enrichment uh, going on for these, uh, but you are not necessarily need or forced to share them. So if you can hide them by using a more restrictive distribution setting, then uh, it's it's better for you, but also for the part that received the data. Uh, and a good way to start to avoid leaking information is to start with a very strict distribution level. So for example, your organization only, when you really start to create your event. And then if it's a large event, obviously it takes time. Uh, but um, then the more you progress on that event and the more confident you are about the quality uh, and the uh, uh, reliability of the information that you have saved in the event, the more permissive you can be with the distribution setting. So what I usually do is I start with distribution uh, distribution setting being my org only, so that only Circle can view the data. And then once I'm feeling more confident about the quality of the data, then I switch it to uh, this community. And then when I'm done, basically, depending on the type of incident, I would speak all communities or connected communities. Uh, yeah. So we have also small widgets that allows you to quickly see how things are set. So we have a small distribution graph that you can use um, and another uh, network that shows you how the data will propagate. Uh, but yeah, these are just information and visual information on how the data will be shared and distributed. That is for this distribution. And for the publication, this is a step that you should not forget to do once you are done with the event, is to publish the event. Um, because if you don't publish it, then a lot of things will not happen. Because when you publish an event, the event will be synchronized with other missed instances. So basically, you are sharing the information with everyone. Um, you will also notify the community that you are on that uh, you've produced something that can be consumed. And finally, you are exposing the data that you have encoded in your event to the API, uh, well, to some API export, to be more precise. Uh, and these exports are usually meant to be used by automation system. That they will just export the data and consume it to protect you. Uh, so if you don't publish the data, then, for example, Yara rules, North rules, Pro rules, whatever you're using, uh, they might not be exported. So yeah, this is an important step not to forget. And that's pretty much it. Uh, so this is just a small summary of everything that we've seen uh, for these 10 commandments. Uh, so yeah, 
will not go over all of them once again, because what we will do now is a demo of encoding a fake incident, and you will see that I will try to adhere to all of these commandments as much as I can. And nothing block you to add more commandments or <laughs> more uh, rules? Uh, Peteris was mentioning different rules during exercises and stuff like that. Yes, indeed. You can add specific rules about uh, classification to use taxonomies and so on, um, based on, on the rules of the uh, sharing communities. Uh, sometimes even uh, you might have different sharing communities within, for example, a, a group of uh, uh, SOC, for example, if you have, I don't know, a blue team or a red teaming exercise and so on, they might even share data at some point or they might not, uh, and they agree on some taxonomies, but sometimes maybe, uh, for example, a blue team that is protecting infrastructures and so on or doing detections might use a specific uh, taxonomy that is not used anywhere else. Um, which is fine too. So uh, it's usually defined by the, po the policy of the, of the communities. Um, and uh, uh, there, is, there is something in MISP that you can even use for that. Uh, we didn't mention it, and I think uh, Sammy will, will show it in the demo, uh, is uh, what we say global or local tags. Um, so you can really uh, have your own local tags if you don't want them to be synchronized anywhere. Um, you can set local tags. And if you just want to share this kind of, of, of taxonomies or classifications, globally, then you can use it. So you can even mix both, um, but we will show you during the, the presentations too. <clears throat> okay. So just, just a recap for, for accessing the thing. So uh, when Sami will do the encoding, he will do his encoding of his own event. But at the same time, if you want, you can connect to, uh, uh, to the instance. Uh, there's a link on the encoding demo, uh, which is uh, basically the, the exercise. It's another page of, uh, of the uh, path. Um, uh, and don't hesitate to connect to the uh, test instance. You are not obliged, but feel free uh, if you want just have to have a look at MISP and, and start to be familiar with the usage of MISP. Uh, that's the thing. And uh, right on the screen, you can see that this page is basically the encoding exercise uh, that we will follow uh, today uh, to do the encoding. Um, but you can either play with it. If you are used to MISP, maybe you want to, to play and see maybe that you are better than us on encoding MISP event. Uh, that's great too. So uh, feel free. I mean, it's, 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 it's up to you. Uh, but we just show that as a kind of example. is is a partial, I would say, synthetic events. Uh, but even if it's, com it's not completely synthetic, it's, you, you'll see that a lot of patterns are, are coming from existing or actual incidents. Um, but this is again, way of the analysis and coding information. We, we try to show you best practices, but again, it's not, there's more than one way to do it. Uh, so that, that's something to keep in mind. Yeah, absolutely. This is an important point. In this, there are no like one definitive way to encode things, but there are some recommendations or best practices to follow. Uh, so yeah, even if you end up with a different event than, than our, well, maybe it's, it's as good or it, maybe it's even better. All right, so let's have a look at this uh, synthetic uh, exercise, which is about a ransomware infection via email. So I will quickly describe uh, what happened, I'll quickly describe the scenario, and then uh, I will proceed to then encode this incident into a MISP event. So before we start, we have uh, small, small resources. Um, so the cheat sheet, type of attribute, type of object, uh, the galaxies in taxonomy that are available. So you are not familiar with this, so we can skip that. And let's jump to the chronology of our incident. So at this specific time, uh, we don't have the date, but we assume that it's uh, um, basically on the 24th. Someone uh, received an email containing a ransomware sent from supposedly uh, someone called Andrew Ryan. Then a few minutes later, the email was read and its attachment open and ex executed. So apparently Mr. Ryan wrote a mail that really made uh, the victim open and execute the executable. Um, then at this, uh, like one second afterward, uh, the execution, the malware added persistence to the system. And then few minutes later, the malware contacted a C2 server and fetched its, uh, its public. 
um, the malware saved the public key in the registry one second after and a few minutes later it started to encrypt everything on the disk and the day after the victim realized oh damn <laughs> uh, i got ransomed uh, by a ransomware and so they contacted the police so this is the chronology and based on this incident, these are the incidents that were collected by, let's say, the, the, the police or the, the people doing the investigation. So they got the email received by the victim. They got the attachment that was part of the email uh, of the ransomware as an executable. They extracted the Windows registry. Uh, they extracted the public key. They had some network traffic captured and they also had the, the message displayed by the ransomware. Uh, but then we, we won't ask you to extract the, the data from these evidences because it's not in the, the objective of this session is not to extract data from evidences, but it's rather to encode extracted data. So we, that, we did that small step for you. Uh, so let's see what we extracted and what we'll have to encode. So we have the original email. So we, we have an email to encode. Uh, the actual ransomware binary, some registry keys, a public key, a command and control server IP address, a beacon address that was displayed on the, by the ransomware, and also a person that uh, either impersonated or that sent a fake mail. Okay, and then in this section below, uh, what we have is the actual data so we have the email we have the whole data so the whole email uh, the ransomware with the actual uh, binary so don't be scared this is not uh, an actual ransomware it's just uh, the putty client executable uh, so it shouldn't be a ransomware uh, it, sh it shouldn't be a malware um, we hope so the <laughs> um, then an ip address some registry keys um, XOR key used for encryption, uh, public key, uh, Bitcoin address, and then uh, information related to a person. And the task that we will do right now is, well, encode everything into MISP. So we'll create an event, we'll create all the data syndicator or supportive data, we'll create the relationship to recreate the story, we'll add some time component, perform enrichment on some attributes. So for example, the IP address, it's interesting to get the location. So the geolocation of that IP address, so we'll do that. Uh, and then we will add some context, extremely important part. So to know what is what, what this event is about, uh, what you can do with the data, how you can use the data. Uh, yeah, all of that good stuff. And then we will finish by writing a small write-up. So basically just uh, an executive summary of what happened. Uh, and then do the last commitment, review the distribution level and publish it. So let's get started. So once again, whenever you want to encode information into MISP, you have to create one event because you can't have floating attributes or objects. So to create an event, you can click on add event on the left sidebar or go in event action and then add event. Then you have to provide uh, the date. So in our case, the date was on uh, the 24th. There we go. Then I can select the distribution level. So remember what I said, I like to start very restrictive and then to increase or to, to make the distribution more relax. Um, so I will keep it the organization only. And then I have to, to choose a value for these optional fields. Um, so right now they are not, I would say deprecated, but I like to consider them as deprecated because you see we, for a trade level, we don't have a lot of uh, room to really describe the, the threat. Same for analysis. So to, to, uh, to cover these aspects, we have dedicated taxonomies for that. So if you want to be more precise on the threat and if you want to be more precise on the advance of the analysis for that uh, incident where well, you can use uh, use these taxonomies but still uh, i will take something that makes sense in our case so it's an ongoing analysis and the thread is uh, let's say low because it must involve uh, 
phishing, and you will see that the mail is not very convincing to actually run the executable. Um, then I have to provide the inventory for, if you remember, uh, the first commandment is to provide a concise and self-explanatory title for that event. Uh, so in our case, I could pick something like, um, uh, if I already know the, the ransomware that, for, that was used, I could use that. So I know that is crypto locker. I could say something like ransomware infection via email, for example. Uh, so uh, okay, let's take uh, ransomware. And just one thing, don't hesitate to revise the name and title over time. Um, it will be resynchronized and so automatically it's, it's changing. So uh, nothing is locked into stone. Um, you, you you will be able to update it. Just keep that in mind if you create events and so on, and you make a mistake. That's fine. You can just update it and so on, uh, uh, because it's, it's basically all miswork is, is is propagating changes and so on. So uh, and that's what we want is it, that people share early and update regularly the, those events uh, and the information. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so extend event. We don't need that. Uh, I think it's pretty good. So I will hit submit. And there we go. So we have our event. So you can see that on this instance, by default, some context is automatically attached uh, to that event. Uh, so in our case, I don't think this is TLPY, white, so we'll get rid of that. And this incident is clearly not OS information, so I can get rid of that too. Uh, workflow state draft. Okay, this event is still a draft, so I can keep it. Then you see the event is basically empty. We don't have any attribute on object, which is absolutely normal. And that's what this warning is about. It says that, okay, you don't have anything to that event. Uh, maybe it's time to add some information. So let's go back to our, um, to our exercise sheet. And let's start to encode information. So this is the email. So uh, what I could do is to just create one attribute that would contain the entire email with the subject, with the, the email body, uh, with the, uh, the uh, expeditor and so on. But you see that I'm already talking about multiple smaller con con concepts, such as the body of the mail, the subject of the mail, um, the, the expeditor. So for that, I already have three attributes. So what I could do is to take the time to create three attributes, but then I would have three attributes that are not linked. Uh, together. So you see immediately that now we need an object to link these. So that's what I will do. Um, so to add an object, you can either click on the add object on the sidebar, or if you are on the table side, you can click on this button, add object. Then you have to select uh, the category in which your object is in. So as I never know in which it is, I click all object, and this is fine because the interface allows me to search for what I'm looking for. So in our case, I want to encode a mail, so I can type mail, and I have email there. This is exactly what I want. So now I'm about to add an email. And you can see we have a huge form, uh, but I don't need to fill any everything. I only need to fill one of these fields. Uh, for example, the subject would be enough, uh, but Clearly for me, it's not enough. I want to encode at least the subject, maybe the expeditor and the body. So let's start with the subject. And so let's see, do we have the subject? There we go. I have the from. So for this one, I could take this one. And I have from there, it's perfect. And finally, the body the body of the mail. For the sake of the exercise, we basically do manual import. Obviously, such kind of import can be automated uh, using tools or uh, mismodule import. Uh, we have a mismodule import for importing OML files, mails, and so on. But today, Sam is using the encoding uh, to show different elements and how to do it manually and so on. Obviously, you can automate that. Uh, but it's to, to be a bit kind of didactic, I would say, to see what, uh, what exactly. is all uh, to be done when, when creating an object. Exactly. Uh, yeah, something that uh, I will mention, or oh, maybe I will mention later on. All right. Uh, so let's say that's pretty good to me. Let's hit submit. And now I arrive in this interface and I can 
quickly review what I'm about to save. So I'm about to save an email. Uh, I have the correct subject, the correct uh, from, and the correct email body. So I can click on create new object. And MISP says object save. And if I scroll down, you can see that I have the object created. Great. So what else can we do now? You see that we also have the crypto locker.exe, so the attachment, the malware attachment that, were, that was attached to the mail. So for this one, I want to add that malware sample to my event. And to add a malware sample, we have a dedicated uh, import interface that you can access by clicking on add attachment. So if you click on add attachment, uh, so where is there we go uh, so if you click on add attachment then you can select uh you can select the category of that attachment so this is payload installation you can even select the distribution of that uh, malware sample uh, so i will keep the one that we have defined on the event i can also put a comment so for example i could say that uh this is the uh, ransomware delivered by mail this is just for, for in, this is just informative so that whenever i'm consulting the event later on i know what what this is about so i could provide even more info but for now that's uh, only thing that i know so that's good for me um, then i have to add the file so on this one i have the crypto locker there and i need to decide whether that uh, file is a malware or not so if uh, if i keep the checkbox uh, set uh, misp will automatically compute the file ashes and other fields such as the, the file size and so on uh, and save that attachment into an object with all the attributes and so on and it will also en encrypt that uh, that executable so that you don't accidentally running if you download it by mistake. Um, you could also check the advanced extraction to extract if it's an executable, the different PE section and so on. But for the sake of that exercise, I will not do it. So whenever you are submitting a malware or a malware sample, make sure that this checkbox is always checked. You hit upload. It says that the attachment uh, have been uploaded. And then you see we have our malware sample as defined there. So we have the file name, the different file ashes that were computed automatically, and the size as well. OK, this is pretty good. So what else do we have in our exercise? We have an IP address. This IP is the IP address of the C2 server. And this one is used to generate um, uh, the secret key. So the C2 server generate the secret key uh, and then give the public key back to the, to the malware. Um, okay, so we have an IP address. Now I'm confronted to a choice because I only have one IP address and nothing else. Do I create an attribute that only contains the IP address or do I contain an object? Normally you would create an object, but I will show you one trick. I will create an attribute this time. So if you decide at one point to, as this one is doing payload delivery more or less, um, then this is, this API address should be blocked. This one should be, in, your protective tool should notify you if you have a device that tries to access or to reach that IP address. And I can provide some contextual command. So I know that this is the IP of the C2 server. Uh, access by the malware. OK. First in that, in date, I don't have the information, so I can hit submit. So now we have an IP address. This is great. But what happened if actually we wanted to have an object or if we already have the IP address and you want to convert it into an object? You can always do it by checking this checkbox 
and then clicking on this group selected attribute into an object button. Then it will propose you some, uh, well, compatible object that you can use. In our case, I want to use the IP port object. So if I click on this one, I end up in the review interface where I can select to merge the attribute into an object. So if I click on this one, then I have an object created out of that attribute. So if you were to quickly import a lot of data, you can then select the one that you want to group into an object. It's, it's a, a good way to, to make the encoding faster. So that was one nice trick that uh, not a lot of people know about. Okay, so let's proceed. So now we have these registry keys. Uh, so the first one is used to add persistence, the second one to hold configuration data, and the third one uh, to contain the, the public key received from the server, from the C2. So let's add this one. So once again, I could create an attribute out of it, but as one of the commandments say, it's better to create an object. So I will create an object for that. So in my case, once again, I don't know in which category the registry key object is. So I click on all objects and then I try it. Uh, regi or oh, could even go for registry. And there we go, registry key. Um, then the only thing I need is either the key, the name or the data. So in our case, what do I have? There are not really data associated to it. I just have the, the path and, and uh, the name. So I can put the key there. Um, the name of the registry key, I guess it's that. Or maybe it's run and then the data is crypto local. Uh, but I think the most important one is this one, the full one. Um, good. So I can hit submit. I end up in this review interface and I can create the object. Now we have our registry key. Let's do the same for the second one. Add another registry key. Um, this one is contain the configuration data. So I'm adding it as a comment. And then I can uh, use this like this. There we go. So I have the path, I have the name of the key, but I don't have the data because I don't have the, uh, the configuration of the malware, which is something that we could uh, add as a context that we request uh, anyone from the team or from other organization to provide the configuration data of the malware if they have it. Okay, seems good. So I can hit submit. I can create the object. And this looks good. Now let's proceed one last time. And let's add the last registry key that we have. Uh, it is this one that contains the public. Um, so I could paste this entire one. I could say that contain the public key from the C2 server. This is great. I have the name of the key and I even have the data because the data is a bit below there. So I can even take it and save and save it as is. Uh, there you see, I could even select the root key that, uh, that is used, but it's not, it's not required. I can hit submit and Miss warns us that, okay, we have a similar object in this event. Uh, so these are the new fields. This is one that is conflicting and this one is already used. So Miss proposes to merge these two objects. But as these two are separate or different entities, I don't want to merge them. So I can create a new object. But if you, for example, you went for a lunch break, then you forgot where you stopped. 
you try to encode this uh, registry key and then you see that you have a 100% hit uh, or overlap, then you know that this whole object already exists. But in our case, it's not, uh, it's not a duplicate. I just want to have a new one. Cool. Then we have to encode that, uh, that encryption key that is XOR with the configuration data that is stored in the version info field. Um, so for this one, um, I could use an object once again. So I could save it as an attribute, but I think it's better to save it as an object because I can benefit from the relationship. And if I have more information about that encryption key, then I can add new attribute to that object. So I will go once again on add object, and then I will use the crypto material object. So crypto material can hold can yeah, can hold a lot of information related to uh, crypto operation, crypto keys, and so on. So in my case, I have uh, where is it? I need to find it. Um, So type this XOR, okay, this is good. And then I need to find the key generic symmetry. There we go. Submit. This looks fine. Perfect. Now I have my symmetry key. And I also have the public key. I know that it was already encoded inside the registry key, but I can always create a new object out of it. Oops. So I can once again take the crypto material one. And this time, as I have a public key, I can put it in, the, in this field, public. Good. Um, is it good enough? I don't have more information about that. Uh, wow. Cool. So you, you see, this, I didn't even know about that one, uh, but you could have provide even the origin of the cryptographic material and the type, I know that it is RSA. Yeah, yes, this one is, is very often used by um, people doing uh, analysis of ransomware cases and uh, they put the key materials because maybe at some point someone was able to factor a key or being able to extract it. So um, that's, that's why it's in quite interesting to give sometimes the information about where it's coming from and then uh, uh, maybe to have the support from other uh, participants or uh, uh, analysts to uh, to decrypt a specific key or factor or factor specific key. Mm. Okay, I'm pretty happy with that. I can create it, and it's good. I like it. Okay, let's proceed. We have a Bitcoin address. Now, Bitcoin address. I could add an attribute that would be the BTC type but it's not a good practice. Better practice is to use an object. So I want to express Bitcoin, uh, BBC transaction, BTC wallet, no, it's not that. Um, maybe let's try with coin, coin address. Coin address yeah. So I have my coin address object and I can put the, the Bitcoin address there. See if I know more information about uh, this one, uh, well, uh, I can provide more information. That's great. So submit. Yes, this is good. And we are almost done. We only have to encode this person. So I could create one attribute that would hold the full name of that person, one attribute that would hold the email uh, and the roles of that person, but you once again, you see we have multiple attributes that can be combined that belong to the same concept. So uh, it's better to create an object. So I want to encode a person. So this is not, so I could use FTM person, but this is related to follow the money. It's not really what I want to express. Uh, I rather want to express uh, like a person actually. Uh, so what do we have? Uh, the full name uh, full name full name full name there we go we also have the email 
Uh, and then we have multiple rows. Uh, so rows, there we go. Uh, as originator. But you see, I'm also asked to add uh, suspect. The suspect row. But I don't have the possibility to put multiple. But actually, there is one hidden way to do it. You see, we, you have a small down arrow uh, button that you can click. And if you click, it creates another row that you can use. So in our case, I could put suspect and I could put uh, uh, source. Let's put it like this. I could fill out all of these, but it's not really needed for our exercise. Pretty happy with it. I can create a new object. And now we are done with our object <clears throat> and with the encoding of our data. Great, so what else are we asked to do? We are asked to create the relationship um, to like encode the, the story in a connected graph. So if we open up the event graph, <coughs> right now we don't have, we have, we actually don't have any attributes, but we have 10 objects that are still unreferenced by others. So if I click on this, uh, on this icon, press the X button to expand the node, then I see all the objects that we have. So what I can do is to use this interface to quickly create the relationship. So um, what I could express, if I go back all the way to the chronology, I know that the mail was sent by someone. So I could start by that. So I have the person and who I am, and we have the mail, which is there. And I could say that this person, add reference, and I can say that this person sends the mail. Now, if I zoom a bit, we have the two objects there, but we still have a lot of unreferenced objects. So let's, let's proceed. We also know that <coughs> the email there, it contains the original malware. So I could add a reference and say that it contains the malware. Good. Now, what else could I also express? Well, we know that the malware, once it's executed, it writes uh, some stuff in the registry, like, for example, the persistence and so on. So what I could do is to take the registry key that is used for persistence, which is, I think it's this one. I can check by expanding the node again and see the content. Yes, it is this one. And so I can say that this one writes, writes information in the registry key. Then I can proceed. Uh, what else do we have? We know that the malware contact the C2 and fetches its configuration. So I can say that this one connects. So the malware, this malware, is connecting to this IP. So I can use a connect relationship, connects, or even connects to. <coughs> Excuse me, what's yes. the shortcut for connecting? I'm trying to do alongside. You are doing something on your keyboard. How yes. are you doing that? It's a good question. So there are two ways to create relationship. The first one is to click on this edit and then add reference. Uh, but there is a second one, uh, which is by uh, pressing the shift key. And then you see you switch into the quick add reference mode. And by pressing the shift key, you can drag and drop stuff. Drag the, the arrow from the origin to the, to the destination. So if you want to know more about the shortcut that you can use, you have this small popover that you can hover. And it gives you like some uh, shortcut that you can use. It's good that you have a noisy keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, sorry about that. <clears throat> um, That's a very good what, question. Yeah, it was a good one. Um, all right. So then the malware also save uh, the configuration uh, and the key in the registry. So I can say that um, the malware writes and it also writes the last one. Good. 
and we are almost down. We have a coin address. Um, we have crypto materials to be to be also added as relationship. So in our case, I can say that the crypto blocker is using these two. So I could say uses, uh, and it's also used the public key to do the encryption. Oops. Small. <laughs> okay, and I can even provide a comment about that relationship. So I could say, okay, it's a, uh, uh, uses the key to encrypt data. And I could have said that it's used to encrypt data, the, the configuration data, not the ransom. And the last one is the coin address. Uh, so this one, uh, mm -hmm. well, maybe I could say that uh, the person is using this coin address to receive its payment. So I could say uses. And now we don't have an reference object anymore. And if we zoom out, we have a nicely connected graph. Uh, where we have the origin, the mail that sent the, the file. Maybe we can show a small hint that is quite, quite, quite cool, uh, especially uh -huh. when you start to do large graph and so on. Um, you, you can save the history of the graph. So if, if you work in, a, in, in teamwork, uh, you might have a different visions of those graphs, which is fine. I mean, it's, there's no issue with that. Um, but in MISP, you can even save the uh, uh, structuration of, of, the, of the graph. So for example, uh, I know that Sammy really like directional graph. Uh, some, some team members like hierarchical graph, and they might want to have uh, this kind of view. And uh, in the even graph view, you can basically do the, the save. And um, so Sammy is currently saving the state of, of this graph. Uh, so that means we have this view, and you can even recall that view. Um, uh, so, if you, so if you yeah. later on you access that event, it's either you or someone else. And then you go in even graph, you see it's all, let's say, uh, randomly distributed. Uh, but this, this is a small graph, so it's fine. But if you have larger one, this can because become tough to read. So you just click on history, and then you can quickly reload it. It's very handy when you are um, working on a very large case. Uh, and then you can have different view and, and so on. Uh, the even graph is quite powerful when you start to I think we won't geek, dig into too much into that today, but um, look at the button on top. Uh, you have plenty of way to filter out the graph, uh, uh, subselect specific part, change the physics of the graphs, and so on. It's it's really 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 handy, especially when you have large investigation and you want to to start to to build your stories and 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 document everything. Okay, so we are starting to slowly run out of time, so I will speed up. A little bit, and I will um, to quickly talk about expansion because we haven't talked about it. Um, if you see a small magnifying glass next to an attribute or an asterisk on the right side, it means that you can add an enrichment. So in our case, what I'm currently doing is I'm fetching uh, the geolocation of that IP address using an enrichment service um, and just selecting what I want to save. And once I click Submit, I need to reload the page because it's done in the background. Now I have the geolocation of that IP address saying that it's uh, it's located in Russia. And if I check again the event graph, we can even see that the relation was created between these two objects. So always Sandy. Uh, we could also do the same for the uh, for the Bitcoin, uh, if there were some transaction for this one, uh, well, this one doesn't work. This is not a valid one, apparently. Um, but we could see all the transaction. <clears throat> uh, so now that we are done encoding all the data, uh, what's our net next task? Do the enrichment. OK, I just did it. And now it's to add the context. So tough part now, context. Um, I think this is the, the most complex part, especially if you don't really have a clear view of what should what sh you should add and what taxonomy and galaxies to use. Um, but right now, MISP is already giving us a recommendation. We are missing one required taxonomy or tag, the TLP one, so I could add it. So let's start with that. 
So if you want to add a tag, just click on this button. And then uh, you can select the taxonomy there. So in our case, it's still B. Um, and in our case, I think the event we are currently creating is TLP green. So I can add the TLP green tag. Um, if I remember the, um, uh, the priority uh, when you do classification, it's, it's about releasability and permissible action. So I also like to add a PP tag saying this in our case is PP green which means that uh, the recipient can do basically almost anything. So they can ping the target, they can block connection, and they can configure honeypot to interact with the target. So I think this is this uh, classification really fits our incident. Then I can also describe the type of incident that we are dealing with. Uh, so I will use a circle taxonomy because I'm a bit familiar with this one. And for this one, I know that uh, it is all about ransom, so I could add the ransomware classification. Uh, so we, we have others. We have the circle uh, incident classification. There is also uh, one with uh, that is done by Enisa. There is also one about uh, that is done by Europol. Uh, but for that, you just need to select one of them and then keep using them. Or if or if you want to be really complete, then in this case you use and you can attach multiple so it's uh, Europol incident maybe malware malware infection mm. or maybe the tag is not enabled on this instance could also be uh, but it's a malware infection so I could add it uh, workforce the draft this is not a draft anymore so I can say that now it's complete oh even review before publication or release requested, let's say, uh, review before publication. And you, can, you can see that Sammy is selecting all uh, global tags. So the, those ones are, are globally yeah. uh, uh, set on the event. So that means they will be synchronized uh, and uh, available to all the instances that are connecting and uh, basically getting this event. Yeah. And last but not least, I think we have a ransomware taxonomy uh, that describe a lot of uh, things that uh, were done by the, the ransomware and in our case uh, it was done by phishing email so I could also include this information. Now I almost contextualize my envelope or my event as much as I wanted. The only thing that I still want to have a look at is the galaxies because we haven't described the malware type, so I already know that it's crypto locker, so I could add this, this information. But you also have a lot of attack patterns that were involved, and I think it's really worth it to include them in the event. So let's, I will start with the, the actual uh, ransomware. Uh, so we have, where is it? Ah, all namespace, then ransomware, the list of all known ransomware. <laughs> Uh, and I know that we are dealing with crypto. Uh, where is it? Crypto. Crypto locker. There we go. Crypto locker. I don't know which one, so we just take generic one. So that now I have the reference. This is great. And I can also start adding the different uh, attack patterns. So to do that, I also click on this one. I can pick my three attack or all namespace, doesn't really matter. And if I click on the pill or the button, I have the Maitre attack matrix displayed. Uh, and if you click on, on the small button inside the button, I have a list of the, all the techniques that I can pick. So um, some technique that just uh, came in my mind because I will not list them all because we're running out of time. Uh, so this one, we are dealing with registry key. So um, registry uh, run start of what this is great. So we have this one. Um, what else do we have? Mm, um, this is a malicious file. Uh, this is even a ransomware. We have some spear phishing involved. We have cryptography involved. So also a spear phishing with malicious attachment. 
Um, do we have encryption somewhere? Um, and encryption exfiltration. No, we don't have really exfiltration of data. Data encrypted for impact. This is great. Uh, so I don't really know which ID to pick. Uh, for that, you would need to, to, to know which one you want to do. Um, we also have cryptography involved once again. And we have asymmetric cryptography and symmetric cryptography. We have the, the two of them. Um, and we have a C2 involved. Uh, so I could maybe, I think there is, a, yes, there is. All right. I'm pretty happy with what I currently have. Obviously, if you're doing something, you should be more or less exhaustive or more complete, uh, more complete than that. But anyway, with that, it's already a, a very good start, I think. And uh, yeah, it's not too bad. Uh, so I could even go further and add context to the attributes. Uh, so for example, for this file, I could add all the capabilities that this file has and can do so that this is the malware that is doing the encryption, that is reusing asymmetric encryption, uh, that is that it was delivered via uh, email attachment. So I could add all of that. Uh, not do it because once again, time constraint. Um, for the malware, where is it? Email, real, registry key. Uh, so this one, this registry key stores the malware configuration. I don't have the malware configuration, so I could add a specific tag to request the help of my team or from someone else that have this uh, extracted malware configuration to be included in that event. Uh, so in that in that case, I could use uh, the, the attack from the collaborative intelligence and say that I want to have the extracted malware config. Uh, and once I have it, obviously, I can get rid of the tag. Um, and lastly, I could specify that this IP address is actually uh, a C2. So for that, I could go in add tag and then use the adversary taxonomy and specify that we are dealing with a C2 server. So select that the infrastructure is a C2. Um, I could even say that this this email is actually the dropper of the file. Uh, and I think we have a dedicated uh, tag for that. So I can run some. I do have dropper somewhere. Oh, great. So this is the dropper. So see, you can really be granular with everything. And when you do your export or when you do your uh, trendings and so on, you can get, really get a lot of information. So one of the last points was to create a small write-up and to review the distribution and publish. So for the write-up, I can be lazy and I can simply take this, go in event report, click on add event report, say uh, executive summary, I can paste that, click submit. And so when I view the report, I can quickly do something like this so that it looks a bit like uh, it was not copy pasted and add a bit of formatting save it and there we go now if i go back to my event i have the small chronology of of uh, that whole uh that all the step that happened so I could even like copy paste all of these, uh, but yeah. And if I wanted to be even go like all the way, uh, I could create another event report that would be the technical details where I could, for example, explain uh, uh, the infection vector, uh, the mitigation that can be put in place to avoid that and all of that good stuff. And the last point is to review the distribution level and publish. So in our case, in our case, everything uh, is eligible for publishing, aside probably or maybe the person, because if it's uh, someone that is being impersonated or if it's a victim, maybe it's not great. 
to share that information. So what I can do is to change the distribution uh, to community or to just your organization. And now as a last step, I can increase the distribution of my event to something like so. So let's say connected communities or just this community, it's up to you to choose. The analysis for me is completed. I can even uh, specify or change the title if I want. So in this case, I know that it's CryptoLocker, so I could put it. I can hit submit. Now everything seems great. And the last task is to publish. I just click the publish. I accept the event to be published. The publishing has been put in a queue. And if I reload now, I have published my event. So by publishing it, the event gets synchronized with other missed instances. Users get notified that a new event was created. And the information contained within that event are exposed to some export format meant for automation. And that is basically it. <laughs> So sorry just, on, you, just on just on time the, um this <laughs> yeah this, this one question uh, uh from christian and i think you want to see a kind of quick demo of the widgets and uh, dashboard um so mm -hmm. it seems to be interested into the uh link to certain tags and so on i was mentioning the two trending tags widget and the event stream one um maybe if yeah. you have like two minutes so like that you can you can quickly see uh yeah anywhere we are the, the training is basically over. We've covered everything that we wanted. So it's now it's like a Q&A. So if you have other questions, feel free to shoot them in the chat or in the, the Q&A section of the call. Um, so let's consider it as a question. And, yeah, I uh, <laughs> the, the dashboard. Um, so you can access the, the built-in dashboard if you click on dashboard. Uh, and there you can have a lot of different dashboards available. Uh, so the one related for tags, and I think we have a good template. Ah, it's not on this one. Um, I had a good one. Where was it again? Um, just give me one second. I will fetch a good one. Um, yeah, something that is interesting with, with uh, widget. Um, um, it's quite interesting there because you can import, export it from different MISP instances. Um, Okay, so there's another question. Uh, how about update to published events? So um, every time that you edit an event, uh, the timestamps change and is unpublished. So it means that every time that you uh, change an event, either uh, change of object, attributes, even report, whatever, the timestamp is uh, basically updated and the published flag is unpublished. So meaning that you need to republish the event to pre-propagate the changes with the different misp instances that you might uh, you might have. So I don't know if it's answer your questions, uh, Matthias, but uh, that's uh, one way of doing it. So meaning that by default, even are unpublished, um, you can configure your misp to make it uh, visible to the same organization, which is a default behavior. Uh, and then uh, when you have an update and so on, you can just publish it and everyone uh, connected and so on can get the event updated. Yeah, this is mainly like usual stuff happening on this piece. Uh, it's uh, you have more data, more information about something. You just add it, you create more data, and then you push this the update to all other misp instances. Or about clustering uh, events to address capabilities affected. You have different way of doing it, but uh, out of my mind, maybe Sammy has better idea than me on this, but for me, it would be uh, to create a galaxy or use an existing galaxy to address, for example, capabilities affected. Um, so you can uh, just create a galaxy saying that, uh, for example, this kind of capabilities has been affected uh, and you can reuse either existing one or create new ones uh, for that. And then you can filter out and cluster your event based on, on that. Uh, it's a bit kind of, of where the Mitre attack works too, uh, where you can see, for example, from a specific trail actors, which kind of technique is, is used. Yeah, so there are multiple ways to do it. You can also rely on the extended event feature to, to like extend another a master event and then 
do them. You can also use specific tags for that. But I think using the Galaxy is indeed a good way to do it. Yeah. Uh, uh, Excellent uh, event is quite interesting when you have a lot of people contributing uh, and you have some that are automatically generated and so on. And you want to have a master event on a specific uh, kind of problem that you have in infrastructures, uh, you can use Excellent event. That works quite well. And then there's another question uh, how to filter events by some attributes, object tags, which is common among them. Yeah, so that's not uh, really not difficult. Yeah. So when you are viewing this event index, you see we have a lot of context there. Uh, if you click on this uh, magnifying glass, then you can provide filtering options. So if the event is published, but you can also filter by tags. So if you would like to see all events that are, I don't know, TLP white, you can select it, click the add button, then apply, and then you would get only the TLP white event. Uh, now for attributes, uh, it's slightly trickier. So you don't, you don't really use, uh, you, you can use this if you, if you want to, so I don't know, eight, 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 eight. But usually when, when you do it, uh, you would rather search for an attribute rather than search all events that are tagged with something and that contain an attribute. You can do it as you can see on the screen, uh, but usually if you want to search for a specific attribute, uh, you click on search attribute there. And then you have a more complete form that allows you to do searches. So you can search on the attribute, the tag, some UIDs, if it was created by some organization, you can even provide information about the type or the category. So you have more control, uh, not only about the value, but also about the type of the attribute. And if you want to use the API, then you can yeah, this go is, to the uh, API, but that will be out of, of, of the scope for today. But if you are curious, there's an API uh, menu where we have the API in documentation and we have even a uh, a very simple tool to uh, uh, make your API request and it's even generating for you Python codes or curl codes with the associated API uh, keys. But that's not for today because it's more introductions. Um, but there's a lot of documentation. We have a very nice uh, Jupyter notebook uh, for all the API use case. So if you want to make some complex filters, like I want these tags with this kind of object and I want this and this from these organizations and so on. So that's, that's more the, the way of, of, of doing it. Uh, but indeed, if you do from the UIs through the search attributes or the index uh, list that you can see uh, and filter out. Uh, another trick that uh, maybe you don't know, but every every single interface and uh, URL in MISP, if you happen .json at the end, you have the JSON representation of the data. Um, Meaning, so for example, if you do look at specific event, um, Sammy is just doing it, you basically end up with the uh, uh, missed score format with the output and so on. So if you want to quickly script things, export data, import from one list to the others and so on, you can do it. Uh, just keep that in mind. Um, if you have multiple miss or you, you are playing around and so on and you want to import data easily and you don't have any synchronizations, dump the JSON, import it back, it works out of the box. And you can even update uh, through that way. Yeah, to come back to the question about the dashboard, uh, so you can you can if you take like five five to ten minutes to to encode a, a good dashboard, this is something that you can end up with. So in this case, we have the top five Maitre attack uh, that are used in this instance. This is my development instance. So you will see a lot of uh, things that don't make sense. Uh, yeah, so I'm only filtering on the tags that start with the Maitre attack namespace, uh, some sharing trends to see who is sharing data, an event stream that shows all the events that were created recently. Uh, you can specify with the field, the limit. You can even specify some filtering. So if you want to only see your event uh, created by your organization or event that were not created by organization or even that contain some specific tags, that's how you can use these widgets. Uh, some sightings, some false positive sightings, some trending tags, so the tags that are most used in this instance. And in that case, this is something uh, more specific. So it's basically uh, a list of tags over time, uh, but based on some filtering. So in this case, we have the top five material attack pattern uh, used by one specific trend actor over time. Uh, so to do that, I'm requesting all the Maitre attack pattern tags, and I'm adding as a filtering uh, the thread actor, APT29. 
and then you can end up with that kind of view. And you can have the same with the top five Maitre attack used by that redactor, but this time not over time, but overall. I don't know if there's any more questions. We still have like max five minutes left. <laughs> uh, so just a reminder, so all the slide decks are available. Um, the video of the session of today will be uh, uh, available publicly, so you can uh, basically watch it again. Uh, again, it was an introduction. Uh, if you have a specific topics, discussion, and so on that you want to extend, we can even do some more sessions later on that are more advanced and so on. Um, and uh, uh, if you have any questions, issues, and so on, there are uh, many chat channels and so on available for uh, Ms. Support, uh, either public or even for some sharing communities and specific uh, specific uh, communities. Um, so a huge thanks to everyone that joins. Uh, I've seen some people using the Miss Pinstance, creating events and so on. That's great. Uh, it's, it's good to see people using it. Uh, if you have any uh, uh, things, issues later on and so on, don't hesitate. Uh, and if you need a certificate of participation for these uh, sessions, uh, don't hesitate to send an email to info at circle.lu and we can provide you uh, uh, for your different organizations. Thanks a lot. And uh, see you uh, very soon. Then. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a Thanks, nice day. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Enjoy your day. Thank you. Nice day. Thank you. Bye.